95% of men orgasm when they have sex and usually it can take them five minutes. Mm -hmm. With women, it's 65% of women only mm -hmm. have orgasms and it usually takes us around 18 minutes yes. to orgasm. So help us explain why. Okay, let's talk about the orgasm gap for a minute. There is a huge disparity in our pleasure when it comes to sex. Typically, men are going to orgasm between, yeah, like let's say five to 10 minutes every time. Women between 18 and 40, 40 minutes. So, hello, there's a gap. That's the first, first part of the gap. The second part of the gap is, yeah, men are going to orgasm most of the time. That's not a problem. I never hear from men saying I can't orgasm during sex. I hear it from women every single day for almost two decades. But the problem is so many women feel... They feel bad about themselves, they feel discouraged, they feel like something's wrong with them, but I just wanna normalize it and say, this is what happens, it is a gap and we have to close that orgasm gap. And it's like, dudes, you're gonna get there, she comes first. Make sure that she gets there, do what you need to do, do the foreplay, do the arousal, find out what turns her on, and if you don't know what turns her on, and she doesn't know what turns her on, well, that's why I wrote this book. I mean, literally, like, I have all these steps. Most of us don't know. Most of us don't know there's a gap. And then we're like, oh, we might know there's a problem and we're not going to turn on, but we don't know why. All right, so today I want to close the gap. Firstly, though, explain to me, it was, what do you say, like 85% of women in gay relationships, yep. though, come. What the hell is going on there, girl? They know the parts. They know the parts. They name the parts through with somebody who knows exactly. They know the plumbing. <laughs> they know the system. They know what's going on. There's no mystery. They can take the time. They can take 20 minutes. They know exactly how it works. They communicate about it. They prioritize orgasms. They prioritize pleasure. So that's what's going on there. That's that. Those are the, we can learn a lot from same-sex women. So is yeah. it literally then? Do you just do you just know it because you know yourself? I think it's both. I think you know yourself. You're like, okay, this looks familiar. And you know that it's important. And you also know, because here's the other thing. It, this is not that easy. It's not so... You might know one vagina or one vulva, but the other, like, we're all really, really different. So I think in lesbian couples, they probably talk about it a lot. And they say, well, I know that this might take you 20 minutes, but what I need is different maybe than what you need. But there's probably less shame around it. There's less educating around it. And there's like, let's both have pleasure. We both deserve an equal opportunity. The problem that's happening in heterosexual relationships is because this information is still shrouded in mystery. We don't really know it. There's a lot of women who are like, I don't know why I'm not having an orgasm. Maybe I should just fake it. Something's wrong with me. You know this. You talk about this all the time. Women assume that it's our fault. We take responsibility for it. But no, I'm here to say like, not your fault. Figure out what you need to please you. But again, in same-sex relationships, they know. They're like, we're not going to fake anything here. We're both going to get ours. Mm -hmm. I love that. So you say shame though. Um, do men not necessarily have as much shame around sex than women? Men have shame. Men and women have shame, but they have different kinds of shame. So <clears throat> where they're similar is we, a lot of us have shame around our body parts. We have shame for men. They might be shameful that they don't like their penis. They don't like the size. They don't like the shape. They think it should be different. They look at porn and they're like, mine doesn't look like that. It doesn't operate that. There's something wrong with me. For women, we shame about the same thing. We shame our body parts, our body size. We feel that it should look differently. We're not happy. And here's the other thing about shame. It just takes one person maybe shaming you directly and you never get over it. I hear from men all the time. I hear from women. In high school, someone said something to me about my vagina and now I forever feel I'm 40 years old and I'm still hating my body parts. So remember that you can't let anyone else take that away from you because what happens is when we are walking around feeling shame, like we don't want to get naked. We want the lights off. We're not letting ourselves have pleasure because one person said something. So that's mm -hmm. why confidence is a really great antidote to all of this shame and yeah. working towards you know, loving your, liking your body, but if it's not loving your body. So dude, the confidence thing is really important. I'd love to kind of break down like also the difference because I kind of think of guys as like, do they really have confidence issues? Like, I, you, they do. And look, I don't want to dismiss that, right? Like, because again, I think what, one of the problems is I kind of think of guys maybe think like us women and vice versa, but of course they don't. But when I think about that piece of the shame, like, um, for women, I, would, you, would you agree, because I don't want to assume, but it feels like it's a lot more psychological than men. Men have a lot of psychological shame too and worry. They really, really do. You know, listen, I feel bad for men because it, my heart goes out to men because men have all the... And we're talking about mainly heterosexual relationships yes, here, but, but men, 
they have to like show up. This is their note. They got to make the move. They got to ask the person out. Then they got to make the move. And they're supposed to know everything about a woman's body and what feels good. Like they're in charge. They're the man. They often don't know. I mean, but the vagina is like the Rubik's Cube of life. <laughs> like literally every single one is different. How are they supposed to know how to unpack this one? Like they don't know. So then they get their heads and this would be a great lover and she's not orgasming. My last partner wanted this move. This partner doesn't want it. So like what the hell am I supposed to do? And so there is a lot of, and then there's a lot of shame around that because they're supposed to know. Mm. And then there's shame about their body parts, there's shame about their bodies. You know, men have so, as, just as many insecurities about their bodies as women do. But I think that we don't talk about it enough. They're not maybe as in touch with it as much. Mm. They overcompensate with other things. Mm. But for women, we're like out to lunch with our friends. We're like, I don't like my body. My left boob is bigger than my right boob. Like we talk about it, we normalize it. But I think that like shame is equal opportunity. Dude, I never thought about that, that women do talk about it. But we men, do. I want that the men don't. He's not like, oh, God, I had too much dessert last night. My jeans aren't buttoned. You're like, whatever. Guys don't say that. Or my penis. He's not going to sit down and saying. go, you know, this one woman at prom told me that I, you know, now I'm 30 years old, but at prom, this woman said she didn't like my penis. Dude, I'm feeling really bad today. Like, guys just don't have those conversations. So I, But women do. Yeah, like, I, I would tell you, I'd be like, I'm feeling it. And then you'd be like, girl, <laughs> you're great. Like, you cheer me up. But we would talk about it. Wow. So they're, they're toiling on their own. I'm always trying to be devil's advocate and think about both sides of it. And so I think that I, I'm actually going to give men a bit more credit now. I feel really bad because I do think porn sets a lot of us up for failure. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically men, it's the one thing that I hear a lot where men are always talking about their size. And so let me, let's actually just talk about that because at least for me, it doesn't really matter. It's like, okay, you're shaking your head. Yeah. It only matters to the penis size we're talking about. Yeah. Let me tell you about this. Men are way more obsessed with their penises than women are. And I hope that there's a huge collective sigh of relief right now. Like, I hope that men around the world watching your show just went, huh, thank God. They're obsessed with it. The size, it's all about the size. But the majority of women are like, listen, that's not even how I'm going to orgasm. That's not even how I'm going to most pleasure. My pleasure has zero to do with your penis. It has everything to do with your fingers or your mouth, or you being kind or nice or dirty talking or listening to what I want and pleasing me. But like your penis is like an afterthought. And again, not for every single one, but for the majority of it, like if men spend more time focusing on what can I do to really turn her on and less on what's wrong with my penis, there'd be a lot more pleasure in the world. Mm. And I think also the other side of things, yes. right? If women didn't worry about like, oh my God, am I, my thighs too big? He's not thinking about your thighs. He is, he's naked with you in the bedroom. He, the last thing he's thinking about is your thighs. I'm telling you, they're not, not, neither one of us are sitting here nitpicking and looking at our partners and because the sexiest thing in the bedroom is somebody who is confident. Mm. But, but the confidence is not a fake bravado confident. The confidence comes from inside. The confidence comes from knowing my worth, knowing my body, knowing what feels good. Because I've done the work on myself to understand my own body and like what feels good. And then having like less shame to talk about it with a partner. But a lot of us just never even get to that point. And so we just are, we're in the bedrooms. We're both really wildly insecure. We're faking pleasure, faking orgasms. And we're not genuinely connecting in a real way. Dude, this is so strong. So if we think that confidence is like the number one thing that people want, I did a poll before you came here. Woo. What do you think was the number one thing that people want to know about? Um, how to be more confident? Was that it? How really? to bring more confidence in the bedroom. Huh. So here I'm we- I'm like, is that it? <laughs> but, but, right, so here we are. This is the number one most important thing and yet this is the number one thing that people need and don't have. Oh my God, let's... That's... So that's why, like, this is why I really wanted to talk about the female male thing, because even just something like that, where it's like, oh, men don't have the confidence because they're so worried about the size. Women don't care. Women don't have the confidence because we're so worried about the size of our hips or our shape of our boobs or are they hanging too low or anything. Men don't care. Nope. So now when we go, hang on, the most important thing that we need is a thing that we don't have. And this is why, because we're in our own heads. Mm -hmm. It's so true. We are in our heads and we are in our heads during sex. The blood flow, first of all, orgasm, pleasure, arousal, it's all about blood flow. That means the head, the blood is like rushing to our heads away from our genitals. Like whenever we're having these disruptive thoughts during sex, it is not serving us at all. And, and here's the thing I want to say about confidence is that confidence isn't what people think either. Like, let me tell you what pe people think that confidence is how many people you've slept with, how often you've had sex. 
you know, maybe how much porn you watched. Maybe it's um, I think a lot of people think it's how many parties you've you've had and 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 like if your partner has an orgasm and all that. But that is zero to do with confidence in the bedroom. Confidence in the bedroom comes from knowing your own body and your own self worth, and then being able to pay attention when with your new partner and paying attention, asking them questions, what feels good. But you both have to be pretty self evolved and self aware to have like a confident couple mm. for sure. And, and even what you were saying, let's think through that. So if we think that the most confident people are the ones that have slept with the most, the truth is it may be, it's the opposite. They're, over trying, they're trying to overcompensate. Exactly. For lack of confidence. I got to tell you, I'm someone who's been out there. I've had to, you know, do my research. I've been with the guy who's the stud. He slept with all these women and that's why he's attractive. And I got to say, and this is, you know, probably not the best lovers in the world because they're not as attentive. Mm -hmm. They're not as... It, they're not as focused. They're not maybe have some of the emotional intelligence that's really, really important for having better sex because maybe they have the bravado or they have the look. So they have whatever it is that's been driving. They've got the pickup lines. They've got that big personality slash personality disorder that's allowed them to maybe mm -hmm. conquer a lot of women. And I would say that sometimes those lovers aren't the most mindful, the most careful, the most present, the most attuned. And great sex is about attunement, embodiment, being in our bodies, being present. And a lot of those guys just pounding away to jackhammer and getting like a jackhammer and getting another notch on their bedpost. Mm, yeah, so true. And in your book, I think you call it, um, I think, I believe it's referring to masturbation as like get your PhD, which I love that you say that. Yeah. And as I was thinking through, I was like, oh, I think that that's also another place where we're maybe we get tripped up, where... If I can be honest, and I always want yes. you to correct me, if I start generalizing, please hold, keep me yes. sober. But like, I just always think, oh, guys have been masturbating since the day that they could move their yes. wrist in that that way, right? <laughs> yeah. And women sometimes have to like watch an episode of Women of Impact and watch you on to go, oh, maybe I need to masturbate, right? So it's kind of like when you're maybe having sex with somebody, the guy does join with a PhD and you join as like a fifth grader. Yeah, exactly. So you want to talk about make me feel less confident, right? Mm -hmm. When you walk into the room or into the bedroom with somebody that's way more experienced with you uh, than you, even if you bring some confidence, I can actually see how you lose some confidence in that way. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how important masturbation is for your overall sexual health and wellness. We were talking about shame earlier. A lot of people grew up in environments where it wasn't okay to masturbate. They were told that it's like shameful, it's wrong. People sort of, they bring that with them throughout their lifetime and they think, well, or, or they have all these, these, all these um, judgments around masturbation. They say like, oh, well, if I masturbate, it means I'm cheating on my partner. They just make all these assessments around it and it's untrue. In fact, masturbation is a huge part of being sexually healthy and sexually well. It is literally how we're going to feel more in touch with our bodies. How is my partner gonna know how to please me if I haven't spent the time learning my body, what feel good, taking what feels good, taking a mirror and looking between my legs. And if you want to talk about the differences between men and women, and I know you do, because in many ways we're the same, but in this way, men typically masturbate way more often than women do. And I do have to remind them and I do have to like, you know, say like sex begets sex. So the more we are giving ourselves pleasure and orgasm, it's gonna help with our desire. It's gonna help us understand our bodies. It's gonna help with sex education so we can communicate. So yeah, masturbation is a huge part of being sexually healthy and sexually well. Okay, I love that. I got a hard question for you, girls. Yes. Is it typically women that feel like their partners are cheating on them if they masturbate? Because I yeah. do have some friends that perceive if their partner watches porn, it means they're cheating on yes. them. Or it means that they're not sexually interested in them. Mm -hmm. But I've only ever heard women say this. I've never heard of a guy saying, well, if my woman watches porn, watches porn, then it means she's not into me. I would say that it's typically more women who think that if their male partner is watching porn, it is cheating than men. What I do hear from men saying is like, why is she masturbating and not telling me or keeping it secret from me? I have heard that because they're like, well, she doesn't want to have sex with me as much or whatever it is. I think that there's just a way that we sort of equate masturbation with a violation and the sanctity of commitment. You know, again, I think that porn has a place in, in erotic, it has a place in our sex lives, but we just need to find the kind that speaks to us. And how do you, thank you for that, and how do you talk through any type of jealousy when it comes to porn in a relationship? I think that the first thing is, is that you have to really just 
first off, have an open conversation about sex with your partner often. I have something in my book called, I give a lot of tips for couples because I know how hard it is for couples to talk. I mean, Lisa, most couples in relationships do not talk about sex ever. Like maybe they talk about the fact like, hey babe, we haven't had sex in a while or we get to have sex tonight. But they don't get into like what sex feels good to us. How often should we have sex? When should we have sex? Or even about porn. Like, what do you think about my porn watching? Would you want to watch porn together? Should we watch porn? Like, there's just all these conversations that really do not happen. So the best way to talk about it is just to say, our intimate life is so important to me. And I hope that you share that you would have a growth mindset around sex and Mm -hmm. I have a growth mindset around sex. You know, we're going to continue to learn and grow together. So is this something that you'd be interested in? Let's talk about our sex life. And then once you do that, you can talk about porn. You were asking about masturbation, right? How do you talk about masturbation? So I think, well, first off, please have these conversations before you walk down the aisle with someone and commit to them for the rest of your life. Because when we bring up sex to our partner, whether it's masturbation or porn or what we want in bed, we typically go into fight or flight because we're not used to it. So you have to say to your partner, I realize we've never talked about sex. I want you to know that I'm not asking you in a way. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not angry. I really want to, again, be the best lovers to each other that we can be. So would you be open to having healthy conversations around sex? When you are having sex with someone, I hope, I have a growth mindset around sex and I want to continue to talk about sex. Are you into that? Mm. See what they say about that. Hopefully they're cool with it. And then you could say, well, let's talk about masturbation. I'm a huge fan of masturbation. Tell me about your masturbation practices. And again, you can tell a lot by these questions. And if your person says, oh God, why are you asking me that? Or mm. I don't do it. Well, then you have to like either just decide and say like, I am probably will have to do a lot of coercing and let, not coercing, but comforting and letting them know these conversations should be very like non-judgmental, curious, open, loving, supportive, and just have a conversation. And it's not a one-time conversation. It has to be ongoing. But learn these things about somebody early on. Mm -hmm. Because if you find out that they're like, why are you asking me that? Porn is wrong. Masturbation is wrong. Well, then you get to decide, is this the person that you want to be with? That's what literally I was going to say. If someone has that judgment, so A, your instinct is to retreat, right? Because no one wants to feel judged by it, especially with something that is so intimate and so vulnerable. So I, I would guess that a lot of people typically would then just shut down and go, okay, I shouldn't say anything. Yeah, typically that's what happens. People shut down and they're like, well, I'm not going to answer this truthfully. I'm not going to answer this honestly. I'm going to, you know, no one's ever asked me this before because what we're talking about is very revolutionary. Even in 2023, to say to your partner, let's talk about our sex life. Let's have a state of the union about our sex life and our relationship. Like, let's talk about it. But I'm telling you, after almost two decades of doing this work, This is the problem. Mm. The problem is that we're not talking about it. The problem is that we go into fight or flight and we get defensive. So, I mean, I think the change can start here. The change can start today and having this conversation. I promise you that once you start to talk about it, it will have less shame around it. It will feel less stressful and scary and you'll have less insecurities around it and it gets more comfortable and then it'll be become fun. It'll be the thing that you're actually looking forward to talking about with your partner once you get past these hurdles of fear and trauma and shame and everything that comes wrapped up in sex. Yeah. Well, let's talk about then things like fantasies and fetish, fetishes, because again, I think that I, I, I'm, I keep projecting, but I'm really just speaking for myself. Growing up, it was definitely, there was so much shame around any fantasy or fetish that may, maybe I had. And then it's like, you just hold on to it because you're like, well, if I say this out loud, what if someone uses it against me? What if I get judged? What if I get belittled? And so you end up not speaking up or saying anything. And that's what led me to, in preparation for this episode, I really did just go on Google and I was like, what are the questions people are asking? What are all the things that people are too ashamed or too embarrassed to ask? So first of all, so let's talk about porn. Let's keep going down this area for a minute. Um, A, um, women do sometimes get threatened by porn. Yes. So, um, Mm -hmm. but I don't think of men getting threatened by porn. Not as much. They don't get threatened by porn as much. They do not. I would say that that is true. I think that if their female partner's watching porn, just regular porn, they're probably like, okay, great, that gives me permission too. And maybe we can watch together and find some things that turn us on. So I think that if you're in a comfortable relationship where you guys talk about everything, then I think that you'll feel that, you know, it's it's okay. You're like, I'm just happy that you're getting off or that you're turned on. And I think that men, but I think it's less, 
it's less common, yeah, for men to get upset about it. And I just think that they're happy that their partner's pleasing themselves. So yeah, I think that there's there's less conversation around that. Because again, the porn that we're talking about is made by men for men. Yeah. And when last time I actually had you on, you were like, oh, and they do audio porn. I was like, oh, what's uh, audio porn? Well, that's porn? the porn that's like, so there's there's mm -hmm. audio porn, there's audio erotica. There's a few companies like Quinn and there's uh, one called Dipsy. There's also porn like Balesa that's literally made from the female gaze. And meaning, it's porn with a plot. <laughs> yeah. There's like, it's there's porn with a plot. There's, there's, um, you know how he met, you know how she met the ski instructor before sleeping with him. Yeah. See, I, they I, rode I, the chairlift together. <laughs> there's real body types, like all different body yeah, types. I love it. There's all different types. Oh. There's all different things. So we feel more welcome into porn, but they call it ethical porn, which isn't very sexy, but that's actually what it's called. And I've got a bunch, I've actually wrote a smart sex resource guide on my website that goes along with the book that's listing all, that lists at the end of the book too. We list all the places you can go for porn that's gonna make you feel aroused and turned on because erotica and porn has a place. Mm. Listen, our brain is the largest sex organ. We need our brain to be stimulated and turned on by sex especially to override a lot of the negative conditioning, but since we don't know where to find inspiration because of what we see mm. in the regular porn that you are Googling, isn't doing it for you. Yeah, It's too aggressive, It's not, you don't see your body type, it makes you feel worse. So it's an emerging field. Uh, it's emergent now to have more stuff that's made for women by women, but it's harder to find and you have to know about it. Still, I love that we're doing it. And in discussing this openly with my husband was when I was just like, no, babe, I need some story. Like, I need to see him dressed as the fireman. Yes, exactly. I need him to get the hose. <laughs> right, the whole thing, like when you have for breakfast, like give me a little bit. We might have to be watching it all day, like what were his family issues? What, what, what challenges did he overcome? I want to know, I want to ask you about my day. There's a dialogue. And then they could go to the banging, exactly. but otherwise. But but it was freeing, right? It's freeing to then be honest with your partner, to say this is the type of thing that I like, and then just completely own it. Exactly, yeah. your partner wants to please you. Listen, if you're in the right relationship, and what a great way to find that you are or you aren't, assume that your partner wants to be an incredible lover to you. Assume that your partner wants to know how to push all of your buttons and to find all the ways that they turn you on. Can't we just give them the benefit of the doubt? Mm. That, and maybe if you do find your partner watching porn and it makes you feel bad, you know, I guess we're saying that women kind of sometimes feel that more than men, then maybe you could just get curious, do a little bit more investigating, ask them about it, maybe find something that you both like. It doesn't have to be the end of the relationship or it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to blow up. If we, have, if we had more of an understanding about our own arousal styles and our own desire and what turns us on, we'd have a lot less strife around sex. What up, homies? It's Lisa Billiou, and I want to tell you about the easiest way to listen to my podcast, Women of Impact. If you're anything like me, time is so freaking precious. It's the thing you're never going to get back. So how on earth do you make the most of it and look for ways to make your life way easier and simpler? And so that's where Amazon Music comes in because listening to Women of Impact on Amazon Music is about as easy as it gets. You can listen on the app, which is super freaking easy to navigate, or you can just ask my homie Alexa. Alexa, play Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Now playing Women of Impact on Amazon Music. See, it's that simple. And let me tell you, the content is freaking fire. If you're ready, my homie, to be a freaking badass, then listen and follow Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Yeah, so much, so true. And then how much, I think, is a big deal as well, in the sense of, I could watch poor maybe once every couple of weeks, I'm yeah. good. Yeah. But, like, some men I know, it's, like, two times a day, you know. Or just And so even just the, the, the cadence, I think, is important to discuss because mm -hmm. I believe you said I got it written down. You said around two hours per week is about average, and anything more than that, maybe it starts to get a little troublesome. Yeah, you know, here's the thing about trouble, trouble with porn. You know when it's a problem. And I'll still tell you if this sounds familiar. So, like, let's say you're watching so much porn. Like, it, when there's a consequence, you're watching so much porn that you no longer can get turned on by your partner. You're watching so much porn that every time you're watching, but this is how you know it's too much porn. And when you're watching so much porn that 
you have to keep escalating the kind of scenes you're watching so they become even more intense and maybe more aggressive that you don't even feel that good about it, but you're like, you know, now I'm watching threesomes and then I'm watching gangbangs and they're really violent, but they don't make me feel good, but they kind of, but I have to do it. So the escalation becomes worrisome. Maybe you have to have porn on every time you're having sex. Maybe you're watching porn so much you can't get to work anymore. Like you're like late for work. When there is a consequence to your porn watching, there might be, a, there's probably a problem there. And what about the desensitization? Is that like really a thing? That is really a thing where you become desensitized to the porn or to a to, to a actual unit. yeah to actual sex because you're like oh well this is just normal sex it's that's nothing real. what I just saw online. yeah it does so that's when you know there's a problem when you're like literally real sex does nothing for you because you're so used to the combination of the audio the video the watching of something that's so aggressive that not even your porn with someone even someone you or not even sex with someone you mm -hmm. love is turning you on and is doing the same thing that 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 it used to. And so you can become desensitized to actual sex. You can kind of convince yourself that it's not, um, it's not as good, not as satisfying. It's easier, think about it, porn's like a quick fix. You know you're gonna get off, you know it's a sure thing, you can roll over, go to bed, you don't have to talk to anybody, you don't have to give back to anybody. Then also social interaction becomes a lot harder. There is a sex recession. I mean, the media loves writing about it. They love sex in the headlines. But there is, there have been studies and there have been some truth to the fact that especially younger people are having less sex right now. Mm. There's a lot of reasons there, you know, that they're suggesting, you know, screen time, COVID set a lot of people back from being being social and being out there in the world. Everything's available on our phones. I mean, I think all of that is true. You know, but I really would love to bring back some good old fashioned like connection, meeting people in person, you know, figuring out how to be sexual again. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, you ready for some more? So, um, the one of the top Google questions, number, number one is where is the G spot? Which makes me think that, oh, men do want to pl pleasure women. Yeah, so they, they do. actually want to know where the G spot uh -huh. is. So I was like, good on you, dude. Yeah, they do. They absolutely do. So, the G spot, just so you know, for years, people like the G spot doesn't exist or it's not a real orgasm or it does exist. I mean, it doesn't, people, for so many years, female anatomy has been understudied and completely debated. And all I want to say is yes, there is a G spot. I call it the G area because it's not necessarily a particular spot. Plus, it was invented to name after this guy, Grafenberg, and he did not have a G spot. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to a man to name the G-spot in a woman and whatever. But the G-spot is essentially the internal clitoral nerve endings. So the clitoris isn't just a little bud, if you don't, maybe you do know or you don't know, isn't just that bud that's outside the vaginal opening, um, the little bud on top. It actually has legs that extend deep inside behind the labia and right there about an inch, to, an inch and a half to two inches inside the vaginal opening up towards the, the, be the belly button is an area. And that area, when stimulated, can feel incredible. Now, to have a G-spot orgasm, it helps to have a clitoral orgasm first mm. and to already be aroused because we're, it's all, orgasm is all about blood flow and it's all about, you know, kind of the stimulus. So you're sort of thinking about that getting revved up, you're getting already turned on and then you'll feel like an area when you're looking for the G-spot with this come hither motion with your finger to towards the belly button, you start to feel a little rough area, kind of like a peach pit and you apply pressure to that area for maximum stimulation. Everybody rewind that again and again and again and play it for your for your guy or for your partner because you just explained it so perfectly so if people are reading and i'm just going to say men just for ease here but obviously it's never going to be just men but if men are looking for how do i you know find the g-spot for my woman they actually want to please you yes. so now as women if we always revert to faking it because we're uncomfortable we're insecure we're now speaking different languages mm -hmm. so that's why again i really want to do this episode and go about, about how we think differently because that was so enlightening because i think that for me again just gonna go back to me yeah. in me faking it i was doing such a disservice to the guy because he thought he found it. He right. thought he was pleasing me and now he's not going to go learn. And to be honest, I probably did a disservice then for the next woman that was to follow exactly. me. Exactly. That's exactly it, Lisa. We are doing a disservice not only to yourself. You're robbing yourself of pleasure. You're robbing yourself of sexual growth, of understanding your body. But then your partner's going, I'm the king of the universe. I can make every woman <laughs> orgasm. And yeah, it's a disservice. But not only that, we just 
So that's part of it. And I was a faker too for many, many years. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why I got into this career because I was like, I do not want to live a life of faking it. I assumed that if my partner had an orgasm and I faked it, like it was a good time because it was more about, his, I prioritized his pleasure over my own. So I had to really do the work. Going back to masturbation, I figured out my most valuable sex information about myself by letting my fingers, a vibrator, figure it all out. Like that's what I had to do. And then when we talk about intimacy and connecting to a partner and what makes great sex and what makes great confidence is because I now know how to please myself. So when my partner's trying to figure it out, right, the different combinations of the Rubik's Cube, I can be like, thanks for trying. You seem really enthusiastic here. Let me show you what I've learned. And a partner who doesn't have ego around it and just has wants to please you is gonna be like, cool, thank God, phew. I don't have to fumble around because you know when you've done the work. So a lot of us don't know and it doesn't surprise you that people are, are Googling like G-spot because we just literally, I mean, let me tell you about that. There's a G-spot, then there's a clitoris and the clitoris in the writing of this book for years, we've all been saying the clitoris is 8,000 nerve endings. The clitoris is 8,000 nerve endings. It is the only sexual organ that exists for pleasure. Come to find out, in the middle of the book, there is a New York Times headline that says it has 12,000 nerve endings. Because <laughs> they just did study. We found 4,000 more nerve endings. A circumcised penis has 4,000 nerve endings. Some would say that the G area is actually clitoral nerve, internal clitoral nerves that sort of come to the head at a spot. So. It's all related. It looks different on everybody. So do some work. Figure it out. Have, have some fun with it. And stop faking it, right? Because we're just doing it. everyone a Please do not is. fake it. I faked it for so many years. Listen, and if you're faking it, I think that it's also okay. Because I, I, I always get questions from people like, what do I do? We might have talked about this. And someone said, maybe someone emailed or inter called. But like, what do you do if you have been faking it all this time? And how do you handle it? And I think first off, just... Letting yourself know that it's okay, having compassion to yourself. And then you could also say to a partner, you know, I really wanted to orgasm and I feel like I've been getting close to it, but I want to have a different kind of orgasm. I want it to be more collaborative. I'm thinking we could learn together. Like, let's slow it down. Let's learn our bodies. I mean, you could say you were faking it. You could say you did. You learned that it was a different way. I'm just trying to help That's what literally I was going to ask you, Emily. So let's, let's play no bullshit. You've been in a relationship, let's say for, I'm not even going to say a long time. Let's say three years. And you've just been faking it. Let's say you've been insecure, you weren't confident yet, you've listened to You didn't think episode, you could, yeah. You didn't think you could, yeah, like all the things that we've spoken about. And now you're like, okay, I understand why I can't fake it anymore. How do you approach that? Like, in all honesty, how do you approach it? Do you think it's a good idea to say, look, I, I just I was a different person yeah. then, I've now learned? Or is it better just to like stay quiet and like just then evolve? What you say to your partner is you just say, okay, so these are the conversations that have to happen outside the bedroom. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have them in the bedroom. You don't want to have it happen when you're like, hey, let, let's, let's just, you know, I love to encourage people and remind people to leave the bedroom for sleeping and for sex. But Actually, this, yes, is what, the three T's? The three T's of communication. Yeah. Have we talked, timing, tone, Please, and turf. Please, yeah. So these are the three T's, timing, tone, and turf. Just remember this when you want to have your conversations about sex. You want to do it at the right time when you are not, remember this, halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. If you are any one of those states, that is not the time to have a conversation about just a charged subject like your sex life. So when you are feeling really good and connected to your partner and you're chilling, you're hanging out, you're going to a movie, you're going for a walk, those are when you want to have, this is when you want to have these conversations. The other, the other time is the tone. The tone is open, curious, confident, and it's light and it's supportive. And it's saying, you know what, babe? I realize that we haven't talked about our sex life before, but I really want to be a great lover to you. I really want to figure out ways that we can be the most supportive together. So, and then you're, and then we can get back to how to do this using the orgasm conversation and the turf is outside the bedroom it can be when you are what i love to tell people is when you're going for a walk because this way you're walking it's intimate but you don't have to make eye contact or the best thing is when you're in a car driving because that way you're like literally to make eye contact but you know that you're safe no one can hear your conversation you're driving along you're like so on a road trip so let's talk about our sex life that's those are like just that's like that's where we start so you're having this conversation you're saying listen i've been 
learning a lot about intimacy lately and sex. I came from a place where I didn't learn a lot about my body. I didn't really understand my orgasms or pleasure or masturbation or any of that. And I was listening to Women of Impact, Lisa Bilyeu and Emily Morris from Sex with Emily. We, they were talking about this and I'd actually never heard this conversation before. And I realized that I've been really invested in our relationship and I really want to make you feel good. And I love, this is when you also can use one of my tips, which is the compliment sandwich. We can go into another tactic and you, this is where you start by telling something that you really love about your sex life. Because this is going to come as a big surprise to your partner. So you say, and I was thinking about our sex life and all the things I love about it. I love how we make out. I love how you slowly kiss me. I love that you're always down to please me. And that's the first part of the bread. And then there's the meat. The meat is when you're giving some constructive feedback and, and you're perhaps you're letting them know that you, you say, you know what? I, what I learned is that when we're together, I have a lot of enthusiasm. A lot of times it seems like I am orgasming. And I've been trying really, really hard to figure out my own body, what makes me feel good. But I had a lot of shame around the fact that I didn't know how to orgasm and I was not being honest with you. I was faking my pleasure. I've been doing it forever, not just with you. I'm going to assume people do it with all their lovers. Mm. And this has nothing to do with you or your penis or anything. It has to do with my own misinformation, not valuing my pleasure, not valuing my body. And then you end that last piece of bread is where we wrap it up. And you're like, and I really hope that we could start to slow down and learn my body together because I know when I start having genuine, real, orgasmic pleasure that our sex life is really going to go to the next level and I could be an even better lover to you and you can be a better lover to me. So would you be willing to take some time to learn and explore it together? That's how you do it. Dude, I mean, that was so wonderful. <laughs> It's hard. It's a tough one, right? Yeah. And you, yeah, I mean, you're probably like, what do you mean? What do you mean? But like, if you understand that the cards are stacked against women, nobody's teaching us how to orgasm. We're watching porn and the women are screaming pleasure when the pain is going inside. And I'm sitting there going like, he's nowhere near her clitoris. There's no <laughs> way she's having pleasure. What the hell is going on? We're told it's supposed to happen in five minutes. Mm. Like everything. So I, I just hope that if you are nervous about this and you do feel shame that the world has not been on your side. Like, it's not like all of your other friends are orgasming like crazy. They're not. They're probably faking it too. So having compassion for yourself and having a partner that's really like down to try, it doesn't mean that you, you can remind them. It doesn't mean that I wasn't enjoying our sex life. Mm -hmm. Remember, it just means that I haven't taken the time to explore. And this is why I also love mutual masturbation. Mutual masturbation is like one of my top tips for people in a relationship. No matter what the stage of your relationship, you don't have to be together 20 years to, to, to do this. I mean, people think, oh God, that's so intimate. Well, once we've cleared, and if you didn't hear this part, rewind, but we talked about masturbation being healthy, a healthy part of your, your sexual health. Assume that you, you know, do masturbate and you've gotten there to say to your partner, would you be down with the two of us can masturbate side by side? Because this way, you're not only, it's like kind of a twofer. You're learning your own body, what feels good. You're seeing what your partner's doing. You're like, oh, like that, first off, it's you're, you're learning what they do. Like, I didn't know that you took your hand and you put up over your penis or you cup your balls. Like maybe next time I'm with your penis, I'll do the same thing. Or with your vagina, like we're learning what they actually do. And it's also really hot. It's hot to see your partner in ecstasy and pleasure and pleasing themselves. And it's kind of a threefer because then you know you're going to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to have pleasure. I love oh, a threefer. Yeah, the threefer. Who doesn't love a threefer, right? <laughs> and what I love also in everything you explain it, if you've had multiple partners, I'm just going to say for myself, I just assumed all guys were the same. Like when I first started having sex with my first boyfriend, I thought, oh, okay, this is what he likes. So I just took that and onto my second person that I slept with because I was like, oh, this is, must be what guys like. And sometimes it's like the complete opposite. Yes. And so understanding and having that like open communication with that like uh, mutual masturbation I think is wonderful because you can actually just see for yourself what they like specifically. Exactly. That's it. That's how you're going to learn. That's how you're going to learn. Everyone's different. Everyone's partner's different. I remember one time I was the guy and he was like, didn't like his balls touched. So for years I didn't touch any balls. And then oh. I was like, okay. But then what some guy was, I do like it. I'm like, great. Like I cannot make assumptions, but that's why the most important thing is to go slow. Every time you're with a, par with a partner, 
you have the opportunity to learn something new. It's a whole new body. They have different sets of nerve endings. They have different things are in different places. So you get to learn together. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but again, I'm just going to speak for myself. I used to make it about me. So in fact, let's talk about a man getting hard, the soft mm. penis. Yes. We always make it about us. We assume, especially women, we, well, I think men do this too, but let's talk about what women do. If he's not hard, I must not be attractive, right? Um, if he's not going down to me, it must mean that I smell or there's something wrong with me. Um, if he's not initiating, he always initiates, but now he's not initiating, what did I do wrong? We immediately make it about ourselves. And especially when it comes to something about sex, well, I think most things actually, it's not about us. It's usually about the other person. With actually most things in life, that's a great lesson. Like it's not... To, unless you get, get curious, ask questions, find out, have these conversations. But we do ourselves such a disservice when we make these assumptions that there's something wrong with us. And then we're just blocking ourselves off from pleasure. We're blocking ourselves off from having the best sex that we can have. So yeah, we are totally making assumptions. And then you just say like, hey, like I actually had a boyfriend that I had this relationship with him and I said to him about the same thing about oral sex. We had been together for about a year, and at the beginning, he used to go down to me all the time, and then he stopped. And I knew that oral sex was a really important source of my arousal. It was like a requirement for me. Like, I wanted oral sex. I liked oral sex. I had just started doing this career. I was learning to ask for what I want. So I said to him, I said, what is it? I actually asked him, I said, is that you don't know what I want? Because I can tell you. Is that you think I don't want it? Or is it just not your thing? And he's like, mm, it's just not my thing. I was like, Okay, well then you're not my thing. Now listen, the truth of the matter is, it might not have been his thing because maybe he had a bad experience with an ex and maybe she didn't like it. Or maybe she, maybe something happened and she told him he was bad at it. Mm. And he internalized it as mm. it's not my thing. Or maybe he was with somebody, like let's be honest, sometimes there is an odor with somebody. And usually if there is, it's because she might have an untreated SDI. A lot of times women have an odor. They might have bacterial vaginosis and they just can't smell it. They don't know it. You can't, it's really hard to get rid of it sometimes. And that just comes from different things. It can come from sex with a new partner. We can have different infections that can lead to an odor that we might not be aware of. So maybe there was a, an experience that just wasn't great and they didn't really know how to handle it. So as a way he's internalized oral sex is something that wasn't his thing. So if that happens to you, if someone's not going down on you, I encourage you to have conversations about anything. Do not make assumptions that it's about you. You could ask them. Maybe they'll say to you, I didn't think that you liked it or had a bad experience once. Or maybe they'll say to you, yeah, maybe there is an odor. Maybe you should get checked by your doctor because in the past you have been smelled this way, but something has shifted and I really care about you and your health. So please go get checked out by a doctor. Now, I know people think they're going to roll over and die. That would be the worst thing ever. But the truth is, if your partner's telling you that it's because they care about you, they want to please you and they want you to be sexually healthy. But most of the time, especially with sex, we make all the assumptions. It's about me. I'm a bad lover. My penis is too soft. You know, and again, we assume if they're not hard, that we're not hot. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, he's not hard. Clearly, I'm not attractive to him anymore. Clearly, my blowjob wasn't good enough. Clearly, and I'm telling you, it could be further from the case. Most of what's happening during sex or not happening during sex has to do with our own mind, our own insecurities. We cock block ourselves. Like, we orgasm block ourselves more than somebody else. We're worried we're not going to come. We're worried we're not going to stay hard. And as a result of that, we don't. So, and that's because we're not talking about it. If we could say to someone, hey, babe, tonight, or if you're going down to me, here's what I actually need. Thanks for that. Like, let me show you what I need. I need you to go a little bit softer, a little bit slower. You know, maybe, you know, and maybe if my neck hurts and I'm the one who's giving, I can get into another position. You know, like we, we have to just give each other permission to, that sex isn't so linear. That you can stop and start and we can talk about things and we can adjust and we can like make it more comfortable. If we went to a movie theater with a partner and we didn't like the popcorn or we didn't like our seats or we were uncomfortable, we would move it around. We would make adjustments. If we went to a restaurant and the meal came, we didn't like it, we would send back our steak. But in sex, we're just accepting mm -hmm. everything that it comes in because we're so afraid of talking about it that we silently suffer through really disappointing experiences and not getting our needs mm -hmm. met. Oh, that's so true. And uh, I'm not sure if you actually just mentioned it, but so many assumptions that we bring to the table. So like um, the assumption and for me was, what, so when I have alcohol, you give me one glass. I mean, we've been out, it's just get giggly. Yeah. I get giggly. I get yeah. funny. It's like, I want to jump my husband's bones. Yeah. I'm like, come it. You know, like I'm very vocal. Yeah. 
And I thought that guys do the same, but when guys drink, actually it um, inhibits them, right? It can from inhibit them. And for, from having Absolutely, orgasms. it can. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, that, listen, there are so many different factors that are contributing to us being sexually healthy. But since we compartmentalize our sex life, we put kind of, we just put it over here and we don't talk about, we don't investigate all the factors. So yes, our health, our physical health, our mental health, all of these things are contributing to it. So if you're someone who's a big drinker, if you're having a cocktail every night or two, I mean, again, we all metabolize alcohol differently, but it could 100% have an impact on your erection. If you're taking an antidepressant or blood pressure medication, it can impact your erection, your ability to have an orgasm. We have to remember that that it's 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 like bioindividuality. We are all so different, and you have to look at all of the factors: your mindset, your physical health, your mental health. How embodied are you? How often do you move your body? How well do you communicate about sex? Those are all the reasons why you're not getting hard, but it does not have to do with you. So with your partner, like if I'm with somebody now, I know like there's a million different things going on, but it's typically not about me. Oh, dude, I've, got so, I've got so much to talk about. So I want to talk about age as well and the difference in age and things like that. So if you don't mind, actually, before we touch on that, do you mind breaking down the five pillars? Yes, of course. So, so here's the five pillars. So again, I was writing this book. I'm like, here's all the tips. We've got the oral chapter. We've got the anal chapter. We've got the sex positions. And then I realized that after all these years, people do want the quick fix, but there are five pillars of becoming sexually intelligent and sexually well that you need to be aware of. They are fundamental. They're the foundation of your sexual health. And they're going to fluctuate throughout your lifetime. They're going to change. They could change day to day, mm. week to week, month to month. So the first one is embodiment. How in my body am I? Do I feel my feet on the floor right now? Do I have my hands on this couch? When I'm having sex with someone, do I feel what's going on in my body or am I leaving and disassociating? The second one is health our overall physical health and mental health. Am I moving my body? Am I in shape? Again, blood flow. If I am not moving my body, not exercising, it's going to impact my sex life. If I'm on medications, I'm not eating well, I'm not healthy. Your so health. I'm saying nutrition, I nutrition bet. Nutrition is massive. Massive. It's a healthy diet. It's foods that feel good to you. That's all important. It's massive. If you exercise, what you eat, and then your mental health. Have you dealt with any traumas? Are you in therapy? All those things are important. What medications are you taking? The third one is collaboration. How well do you communicate with your partner about your sex life? Do you talk about it? Do you have resentments? Are you withholding on things? You might even have something going on in your relationship right now that you haven't talked to your partner about. That's going to impact your ability to be sexual. So that's collaboration. And then there's self-acceptance. Do I accept myself where I am today? Do I accept my body? Do I accept myself, my, my sexual experience? And that's really the confidence one. How confident am I? How much do I accept my where I'm at today? And then the fifth pillar is your self-knowledge. Do I know what turns me on? Do I know my fantasies, my fetishes? What temperature I need the room to be? What time of day I'm the most aroused and turned on? What I need leading up to sex? Do I need to shower? Do I need a clean house? Um, do I need dirty talk? Do I need... So it's really about taking all your years of sexual history, everything that you've done, and to date, how well do you know yourself? And the combination of all five of those pillars are going to help you feel sexually healthy and well. And I do have a sex IQ quiz. It is a very loving quiz. It's going to guide you in the direction of where you might want to focus first of how you can start to become more sexually aware, healthy, and conscious. Oh, I conscious. love that. And I love how you break it down and you call it the sex IQ, which is so small because then smart pun intended. Um, so you can like really figure out like how smart you are over there and then exactly. how do you get better because that is so important that there's these different pillars you really do need to touch. And as part of what I wanted to go deep down is the, the age, right? So taking all of your past, you even said your knowledge and things like that. And then I never, it never occurred to me to think about, oh, when I was 21, this is what I was into. Obviously I was married at 23. So like my sex drive, my husband's sex drive, our interaction, our dynamic is very different now that I'm in my 40s, yeah. been married for 20 years. Yeah. And really talking through a, just the difference in age from a psychological and physical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and then with experience and how you've evolved. So let's actually just take take the, the, the mindset and the physiology. So number one, when I first met my husband, he was four times a day, like <laughs> rabbits. I was bloody exhausted. I was like, does this man want to do anything else from this time? Right. And then now, 20 years later, he's like, babe, I'm not the 20-year-old guy. 
immediately the first thing I thought of is, oh, it's me. Am I getting too old for him? And so I just, because as you yes. know, my relationship with him, we're very open. So I was like, babe, is everything okay? You know, and his response being very honest, he's just like, I'm not 20 years old anymore. Yeah. But if you're not, if you don't have that communication, how many of us project or think through, hang on a minute, we had this really hot, spicy sex for the first few months. He couldn't keep his hands off me. And now two years later, like, mm -hmm. He's burping and yeah. snoring <laughs> and, you know, like exactly. that sort of thing. We make it about us. Mm, we totally do, Lisa. And I'm glad you brought this up because we need to normalize the fact that at the beginning of any relationship, this is why you're together. They call it the honeymoon phase for a reason. It feels amazing. You've got this... Uh, delicious feel-good cocktail of all those hormones that feel so good, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and they are firing in all cylinders. It's new, exciting. I've never kissed this person this way. I've never touched this person this way. Like, it's just a thrill. However, it is a drug. You literally look at the brainwave patterns of people falling in love and people like in the new stage and people on cocaine and they had the same exact brainwaves. It is a drug. This is what's happening. It's the hormones. Just like anything that great that feels that good, what goes up has to come down. It, you cannot sustain and maintain that level of attraction and arousal. You can still be attracted to each other, but what I say is it looks differently. It morphs, it changes over time. And that's when I usually start seeing people. Very few people are coming at me in the honeymoon phase because there's no problems. Mm. This is the best person. They smell so good. They taste so good. They can do no wrong. They are my everything. We're having sex all the time until they're not. And so this is when the communication, the collaboration, the knowledge all has to come into play because things do change over time. We do get set in our ways. Our hormones change. You know, our hormones for women, we're on a 28 day cycle. So not only year to year, but month to month, there's certain times a month where, you know, some women find when they, right before ovulation, they are so horny. They want sex all the time, but when they have their period, less so. And then for men also, we've got hormones. I mean, there's a lot of sex that hormone driven, but when men get into their 40s, for many, there's a drop in testosterone. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different factors that are coming into play that we have to pay attention to all of them. Again, that's why the five pillars come in handy, but also just what you want in your 20s, even like food-wise, movies-wise, book-wise, like everything changes. But since there's not a lot of information around sex, sometimes we just keep having sex the same way. We're setting ourselves up against the same standards and we're just changing. And so that's why I encourage people to look at their sex life as a journey, right? Like th it's changing and you're exploring and there's so much that you can learn together. Like get curious about your mm -hmm. sex life. Download my yes, no, maybe list, which is at my website, sexwithemily.com. It has 80 different sex acts, like dirty talk, spanking, kissing, taking a bath together. I mean, and you can get to, together, you can make, we just updated it. So it's an interactive. Is it a yes? Is it a no? Is it a maybe? Because what we crave in long-term relationships, we crave the spontaneity, the newness, the novelty. So sometimes trying something new could just be a vibrator, a lubricant, a new position, but that's going to stoke the dopamine and the newness and the excitement. So these are the level of conversations I want people to have. Babe, how many times a week feels good to us? When do we want it? You know, we've decided we don't want it every day. And if you want it four times a week and I want it once a week, so that means we need to find two and a half times a week to connect on our best days. How do we do that? And I also want to encourage people to know that it doesn't have to be just intercourse. And in fact, I encourage you all that maybe it's mutual masturbation. Maybe it's a massage. Maybe one day you give your partner a massage, they give you a massage because sometimes we're not necessarily craving the sex, but we're craving connection and intimacy. Mm, that's and so that's going to change. Oh, dude. Okay. There's so many good things there. Um, <laughs> oh, my okay. God. Okay. So, first of all, I want to talk about... I didn't had I had no idea that depending on so as we're talking about like the age and depending on you know when you meet them and things like that there's going to be so many different variables and it never dawned on me it never dawned on me there were so many different variables so for instance and again I I, I did a, just a Google I search um, what are the things that women most search for and it broke it down depending on where you're from and how old you are. And okay. I was like, oh my God, there's so much complexity here. Yes. No one, none of us are mind readers. So depending on what city or what country you're from and how old you are, it's gonna differ from the search and your interest. So let me just throw a few wow. out. I found okay. this totally fascinating. So for instance, in the United States right now, women are 102% more likely to view an ebony porn video. 
and um, British are thirty one percent more likely to watch rough sex videos. British okay. people, okay. So just by depending on where you're from, uh -huh. you're searching for different things. Um, this was fascinating. Um, women in Canada are thirty six percent more likely to be into threesomes than French women are. Uh, one hundred and three percent more into cuckold videos. So. In just doing my research on the different wow. country, women, this is women searching, are interested in different things. Now you want to throw in age. I'm just going to throw, th yeah. I just found this fascinating again. Um, the thing that women are looking most for, the age between 25 and 35 are tattooed women in porn. Really? Interesting. I have no idea. I'm not quite yep. sure why. Between the age of 35 and 44, they're looking for double penetration. Okay. <laughs> and between uh, 55 and 64, they're looking for porn called vintage porn, which who knew that actually existed? Yeah, probably porn back from when they were younger, right? The, Maybe. Uh, old school porn. And now the last care. one, 65 Age 65 and older, they're 143% more likely to look for videos about hand jobs. Interesting. So as I started to go down a rabbit hole, as you can see, I was like, in everything we're talking about, when you're meeting someone for the first time, compared to now being in a relationship, let's say, for 15, 20 years, now, depending on when you were born, where you were born, where you're from, like the age, there's so much mystery that the reason why I really want to talk about this is like now, hopefully people are like, oh, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know anything about someone else. Yeah. I can only know about myself. Right, exactly. And how fun to get to, to learn when you're with somebody new. Don't make any assumptions about their sex life that you know their history. Just like when you meet someone and you ask them, like, what's your passion? And what's your favorite trip? Where do you want to go traveling when you're older? What, would you, what did you want to be when you grew up? What do you want to do? Like, like get curious about their, their sexual interests as well. I also have the 69 questions in the book. I have like, these cards that you can... And, you can find also on my website, but mostly in the book is these 69 questions. So these 69 questions are basically questions that you ask your partner to get to know them better sexually. Because I get that we might not know the questions to ask. We might be really shut down. And that's why I mean, a lot of what I do is give people the tools so you can get curious and you can learn more. We cannot make assumptions and how great to know, like, what's your biggest turn on? What's the most memorable time you've had sex? When do you feel the most loved? When do you feel the most turned on? What's your number one fantasy? What's the, you know, what's your favorite sex position? Like, have fun with this. Because again, once we melt away the shame and the worry and the judgment, and you're with a partner who's like, yes, I want to learn. Yes, let's do this. Like, let's go. You're going to have so much more pleasure and way, way less pain. So talking about it, as you can see with all these differences, it's just, it's, it's, it's the most important thing you can do when it comes to sex. What do you think is the most, having done all of your work and your book, and I mean, you've just been in this industry talking about for sex for so long, what do you think is like the hardest thing for people to really do? I think it would be to talk about it in a non-shaming, non-blaming way hmm. where they're really, really good listeners and they learn to prioritize their sex life and figure out and recognize that that they have different arousal patterns and different arousal styles. So yeah, I would have to say it's communication. Communication is a lubrication. I would say it's really hard for people to, to talk about sex in a way that's productive and helpful. That's what I was going to say. How do you like advise them to stay open to it? Because if that is the number one thing That's where it's it. like people just got to communicate and then the belief system that they bring to the table, right? It's like when you about talk that. about the shame and the judgment, it really is the belief system of who you are and then what it means to say X, Y, and Z or do X, Y, and Z, especially when you're brought up in a religious household. Exactly. Like growing up Greek Orthodox, yeah. sex wasn't discussed. But, Literally, no. my grandmother was the stork, brought the baby. Exactly. They don't even, right. Yeah, that's what my grandmother <laughs> told me. <laughs> right, you don't know. You're like, okay, look, look, that, that, that's it. Why would you believe any different? So here we have this thing, which is sex, which is like just completely shrouded in mystery. And then we send our kids off into the world. It's like giving them the keys to the car without having taken driver's training. That's what sex is. Sex is people are going out into the world and they're like piecing together things they were told. If they grew up in a religious environment, it's shameful and wrong to have sex even beyond if it's not for procreation. So the deck, the decks are set again, are, are stacked against most of us when it comes to sex. So being able to unpack everything that you've been told to unlearn everything that's wrong, which is a lot of the things, and then to 
relearn to follow sex positive voices, to to challenge your own beliefs and saying like, what are my limiting beliefs around sex? Oh, I feel like if I ask for what I want in bed that I'm a slut. Or I feel like if this partner tries to this thing, that means that they're too easy. Or it means that mm-hmm. we have so many judgments around it. And so once those start to melt away and we decide that we get to decide who we want to be as a sexual being, we're in charge of that message. It makes it a lot easier to be in a healthy relationship so you can go forward because the actual technical sex, we can troubleshoot all that. Like you have pain, you want to do a certain position, your partner wants to try something new, they want to try a fantasy, they want to try a kink. Like that stuff's easy. It's all the other stuff that we bring around and that makes sex really, really hard. And so thank you. And I don't think I'm giving anything away because you say it in your book, but you went from the person who would fake it to now, I, you said 23 orgasms in a day. I, I was did. like, homie, <laughs> teach a woman how. <laughs> what up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank. One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Like, I well, thought seven was amazing. Yeah. I was like, I feel like I'm the queen. Seven's great. Well, I was like, you know, I had a lot of time that day. <laughs> I had our friend, the magic wand. Okay. We love it. We do love the magic yeah. one. Um, so, no, it was like, it was through the partner and we were exploring, we were having fun. And then I just like, you, because here's the thing about women. This is why we're so amazing. Okay, here's the difference between men and women. Ready? Mm-hmm. Men have a longer refractory period. That is the time that it takes them to have an orgasm, get hard again, and have another one. For some men, it can be five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour as we get older. For some men, it's 24 hours. Mm-hmm. For women, we are bliss is where we're very blessed. We can have many, many orgasms and it's regenerative. It's help, it's you know, multiple orgasms, but we don't realize it. We don't realize the source of our of our um, I guess of our potential. We don't realize our eroticism. We don't understand that once we can fan the flames and have one orgasm, we can it's all energy, right? So sex is energy and it's we can have to circulate that energy in our body. So it's by like breathing into our first orgasm. And then maybe if we are using our hand or a penis or a toy, we take that away. And then we just start to breathe until we start to feel it rise again. And then we can bring something back. So I think, believe that day I was playing with a partner. We were experimenting, using toys, doing a lot of different things. And it was a, it was a long, fun evening. So, but like, you can't rush through it, girl. I'm like, I'm like, I want to know what you do. So you woke up. <laughs> okay. So actually I'm joking, but I'm not really joking. So. I'm going to assume, so you were not stressed. No. You cleared your day. Because I'm really like, serious, yes. let's, let's break this. Because if I, I want to get to 23, we were on vacation. You were on vacation? You were on vacation? We were away. We were like okay. away at a, yeah. Okay, so no distractions. No distractions, no work. Okay, you had been with him for, you were comfortable. I've been with him about a year and a half. Okay, so you were comfortable to be around him. I felt you safe. Had, okay, so you've had sex before, felt safe. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're on vacation, which probably means you're getting vitamin D. Yes of getting vitamin D. I didn't have the stressors of my home. Remember we talked about novelty being a huge connecting force Uh for couples. I didn't have to look in the corner and see my laundry or the unpaid bills or it was something new. It was new for both of us. We had never been in this hotel room before. We had never been in this place before. It was exciting. It was sunny. It was warm. There was vitamin D. There was a sense of connection and excitement and we knew that we were going to try. I mean, listen, you know this. One of the great perks of my job is I get a lot of great pleasure products sent to me every single day. So we brought a bunch of new, not fun things. To and play you spoke with. about that before. Yeah. So it becomes the foreplay of like, oh, should we? Yeah. Okay. What should we bring? Yeah. I had lingerie. I had arousal gels. I had sex toys. I had games. I had all this really fun stuff to play with. Okay. It was like a sex wonderland. Literally, I think I had a second suitcase. <laughs> I had everything we needed for pleasure. Okay. So you were very prepared. Very prepared. Okay. Yep. I was very calm. I was prepared. Okay. I think a lot of times when we set ourselves up for like, I'm going to try to have 20 orgasms a day, like it's not going to happen. It yep. was pressure. It was more like, we've got time. We've got yeah. luxury. We, I think we worked out that morning. Okay. We went on a hike. We came back. We had sex. We had breakfast. We were just really aroused, turned on. We went swimming, came back. We're wet. We're, you know, it kept going throughout the day. And so really that's what it was about. We're like, and, and I was just an enthusiastic, 
loving partner who my energy fed his energy, mm-hmm. his energy fed my energy. So it was, I mean, remember, that's what sex is. The partners that you want to be with, you're feeding off of each other's arousal and desire and orgasms, and it keeps going. And so I think that he was excited, that I was excited. Like, again, that's what that's what great sex is about. So it went throughout the day, throughout the evening, and we slept, I slept really, really well. <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> that's amazing. Do you have any, like, did you have any ex- or like scents and things like that or was it so I always do so when I want to have like a really sexy evening I love massage candles so here's the thing about having what I what I consider to be really great connected sex is I like to bring all of the senses into my environment I like to like when you hear like about a romantic bedroom or a sexy place I love massage candles I love a candle that can burn in, this is not a regular candle, but it burns into like really luxurious oils. So you have like a candle that you blow out and then you can pour that on your partner, you pour, they pour it on you and it's like warm and it turns into massage oil. So I love that. So I love having that scent. We had a really sexy playlist going. We had the waves of the ocean like lapping up on the shore. We had, you know, we had, you know, just, um, yes, we had music, we had touch, we had, um, fabrics that make me feel good. Here's the other thing I want to say about senses and arousal is that, yes, it's good to be sexy for a partner, but really this goes back to confidence. What makes me feel turned on? What makes me feel sexy? So I was wearing some sexy things that I felt really good in, like some lacy, strappy, more bondage type gear that was what I was into at the time. We had some fun, kinky things to play with. Here's the other thing about about collaborating sexually. That's something spanking or using a paddle or tying each other up or using blindfolds. It's just another way to play. I think people picture that stuff to be like this 50, you know, 50 shades of gray or red room of pain. It really just means that when you take away one sense, the other senses become more heightened. So there was a lot of things to play with. There was a lot of fodder for our pleasure. Dude, that's so cool. Um, how much do you talk about then role play within it? So like, as you were saying, spanking, how much do you actually, if if you don't mind actually uh, no. discussing this, Let's because talk about it. it can be a little sensitive, but like, for <laughs> instance, if I turned around and it, I, I did that, where you just write the environment, the place, like all the candles, Tom, I think would probably dig it. If I turned around and spanked him though, he'd be so fucking surprised. He'd like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> so how much do you actually talk about role play? Because Tom and I, when we talk about masculine and feminine, we very much talk about that. And again, just being very honest with our communication, yeah. he's always been very honest with it. He likes the masculine role. Yeah. And I'm always very honest. I like him to play the masculine. I don't like the dominatrix yes. part. Again, zero judgment. Fucking go ham if you like yeah. it. But discussing that, how much do you think it's important to discuss ahead of time? Really important. And how much can people ebb and flow between roles? Some people ebb and throw. It's such a great question because I think the masculine and the feminine is a really important conversation of the sexual polarity. Mm, yeah, can you explain yeah, that? Because I, I was actually, expect- I love the Yeah, so, so polarity is a really interesting concept. And I think that it's a newer concept for many people and they get caught up in the gender. So I'm not talking about gender at all here. I'm not talking about, like, you could have two men, two women. To create polarity, to create opposition, you need a positive force and negative force. Think of two magnets. If you have two positive magnets, they're going to detract. So you need the positive and the negative force. So then you need the masculine and the feminine. And we all have it inside of us. You and I both, we run businesses, we're badass, I run, I'm in my masculine, I'd say more than I'm in my feminine throughout Mm. the day. I'm in phone calls, Mm -hmm. I'm doing shit, I'm doing shows, I'm making deals, I'm talking, I'm like getting shit done. That getting shit done mentality is the masculine. We, again, we all have it in us. And the masculine is more directive, it's purposeful, it has a mission, it has, it's more of the structure. And the feminine is more nurturing, creative, there's more flow, there's more energy, it's more ethereal. That is the feminine. So I have that too in my in my daily life, but I would say I am more into the masculine. When I go into the bedroom, I am in my feminine. I feel more, I am more submissive. I want my partner to be more dominant. Again, some people are switches. Some people do both. Sometimes they, you know, and Don't get me wrong, like sometimes with my partner, I'll want to give him a massage. I'll want to lead. I'll want to do at his pleasure. Then he'll turn to me and make it about my pleasure. That's different than saying like, I want him to take the lead. And just remember this, couples who find that they have, don't have the chemistry anymore, that can't get it going, 
it's because they're either both in their masculine or they're both in their feminine. No one's making a move. No one's initiating. This train isn't going anywhere. That's platonic. That's a platonic relationship, okay? There is no chemistry there. You have to have somebody lead and follow. If nobody initiates, there's zero sex happening, mm -hmm. okay? If you're both passive, nothing's gonna happen. So it's understanding that polarity and how that manifests and how that looks in relationships is very, very different. But to go back to the spanking, for example, I just talked to my partner about it. I'm like, I like when you're playful. I like when you, you know, tug my hair or you give me a spanking. You know, we, we did the yes, no, maybe list. Like we literally did that when we first started dating and it was like, what's your yes, what's your no, what's your maybe. And we went through a whole bunch of sex acts and how fun to find out like you like spanking, I like spanking. And I think it was very clear that I am more the submissive and he is more the dominant. And so it was clear that I would like to be spanked or I would like to be tied up, you know? And if he asked me for that, I would be down to do that. But, you know, it hasn't come up yet and that's fine. He knows like his role. And for him, it feels really good to be in charge and that helps him fuel his masculine. So it's just a concept of polarity. And so getting into that now, here's the other thing that I think is really important for people to understand. As a woman and who likes to be submissive, I need to consciously get myself into the feminine in order to receive in the bedroom. Otherwise, like I'm bringing up work in the bedroom and what I wanna do, like that is not hot. That's not gonna spark the flames of our desire. So when I know that I wanna be my feminine, for me, it's slowing things down, it's taking a bath, it's breath work. When I breathe, deeply into my pelvic, like, like if I just stop for a few minutes and I breathe or I take a bath or I know that all day, like I need a disconnect between work and like love and romance and attraction. So I'll take a bath. I put some of my best smelling oil in my body. I'm touching my body. I'm connected to my body again. And then I breathe. Maybe it's just 10 deep breaths, but when you breathe, you want to connect to your power source, which is your pelvic floor, where all the sexual energy and arousal, no matter what your body part is, you can relate to the fact that when you're feeling turned on, you're feeling it in your genitals. You're feeling it right here. So this goes for men and for women as well, because I also don't want to make the assumption that every man is just ready to go. That's a disservice mm -hmm. to men. Like you should always be hard and turn on and ready to go. But as a woman, what I do is I will breathe deeply, like a long breath, and then I'll do a little kegel. Okay, mm. a kegel is those pee stopping muscles that stop and start the flow of urine. We all and men can do them too. So when you do that, it's almost like you're pumping your sex, your sexual organs. You're pumping them and you're waking them up. So I'll breathe, maybe I'll take five deep breaths in and then I'll do a kegel. And then I release on the way out. I'm not doing them right now. Yeah, <laughs> and do a kegel. Well, when you do that, you're like, hello, I'm here, I'm connecting, I'm awakening. Because throughout the day, like, let me tell you this, Lisa, we talk about the top questions I get asked is, how do I get turned on for sex? Why aren't I in the mood anymore? Well, a lot of us walk around and all day long, we are disconnected from our bodies. Maybe we're not even liking our bodies. We're actually, dis we, we're hating our bodies. And I hear this from women a lot, more than men too, that we just are having like, not body love at all, like body hate. I can't believe I gained weight. I didn't work out. Why did I eat this? Why did I do that? I don't like the shape of my butt. I don't like the shape of my hand, whatever it is. And then we think that we should get into the bedroom and feel turned on and ready to go. If you are abusing yourself throughout the day verbally, it is not going to happen that way. So we have to do practices too. And I've got a lot of that in the book too. And this is one of the pillars is learning to feel more safe, secure, and confident in our body. And I'm not even talking about body love because that could be a big stretch for some people. It could just be being neutral. It could be body neutrality. Mm. Today, I'm not going to hate my body. Today, I'm going to be neutral. I'm going to find a few things that I love about my body. You know, I love that my legs can walk me up the stairs. I love that my legs can get, you know, get me, you know, across town or that my hands can, you know, draw because I love to draw. Like we all have things that we can find that we love about our body. And as cheesy as that might sound to be like, oh yeah, you want me to like, yeah, it actually works. Like I'm telling you, this stuff works. We have to find what we love and what's working for us because otherwise it is just, we're, we're going to be robbing ourselves of pleasure, which is such a cornerstone of our or joy. Yeah, did, you were the one that actually introduced me to the neutrality thing because before I didn't even realize how much I was just insulting myself. So it wasn't even like talk nicely to yourself. It's like, no, just identify when you're talking badly about yourself. And I think yes. you were like saying, just know, just walk past the mirror and see how often you, you give yourself a negative yes. comment. I was like, oh my God, all the time. It was like this automatic response. Yeah. And I didn't even realize I was doing it until you pointed it out. Mm. So my first step was just stop 
being mean to yourself, right? Yes. And then it was like, okay, that's a good step in the right direction. Yes. Um, and going back to what you were saying about like, especially us women now who are working more, building our own businesses, becoming freaking badasses, wanting to be our own bosses, there is that um, complex juxtaposition between being a badass, being super strong, being in your masculine when you're at work and then going home and then being in your feminine and being able to be honest with that because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, if you're like this, then you're always going to be like this. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'd love to ask you, when you're in your masculine, you met somebody new, do mm -hmm. you talk about wanting to be in your feminine? Because I'm going to make an assumption. Some people may project and see you as a badass and go, oh, well, she wants to be dominant in the bedroom too. Mm -hmm. So as women now who may be listening who are freaking badasses, how do they communicate with their partner that actually they want to be in the feminine? And then I loved how you just broke down mm -hmm. how you go into your feminine. Yeah, I I think that these women have to cultivate their feminine. I think I'm hearing this from a lot of women too. They're like, like they go on dates, they can't find a guy, guys aren't attracted, or they, they, they're not making the move or whatever, and they're not feeling sexual or attracted to anyone. If you know that you are a woman who in the bedroom, you want to go into your feminine and you want to be more submissive, you have to bring that submissive person to your date. To the person, you have to. She, they have to show up, and I know it doesn't feel safe if we've been told that we gotta kick ass and we gotta be productive. We gotta check things up our list. We really are living in a man's world. It is. It is a. It is a masculine world. Everything is set up that way. We have to achieve. We have to go. We have to check things off the list. And so when we're going out with somebody or when we're like learning someone new, we have to learn to cultivate. And the best way I can do that. And again, you might. I might lose you all with this. It might sound very, very woo to people, but I am telling you, it is energy. And so when I have found that I am not like like that, I really take a few minutes and I breathe and I even start to do things where I I start to like move my pelvic floor. Like this is the circulation. You start to move. Like you could be in a bar, you could be at a dinner, you could be somewhere, somewhere. And when you start to connect your breath and your body to your pelvic floor, even if it's just like moving in a counter circle motion and then moving it back the other way, you are starting to, and there's been studies and there've been exercises that show that that energy is going to be emanated mm. and your partner or somebody that masculine is going to be able to pick up on that energy and respond to that and feel that. And that's how you start to cultivate it. And you can do this on your own. I did some pole dancing too. Shout mm. out to my girl, Sheila Kelly. She's been doing it for almost 20 years. She had thing called S-curve. And this pole dancing is not about like looking sexy for anybody else. It's about moving to the, the natural S-curve of your body and learning to move in a way that is, that is supportive of the feminine of your pelvic floor, of your ass, of your breasts, and just learning to, and like letting go of tension, like learning to dance, like dancing is a very feminine, mm -hmm. is a very feminine place to be. So even if you just dance around your room naked, you know, you don't have to go take a class like that. But for me learning that I haven't danced in a while, I haven't let go, I haven't listened to music, that is the feminine, that is the creativity. So before you go on a date, it doesn't mean weak. Feminine is not weak. Mm -hmm. Feminine is, is is your is your birthright. Feminine is who you are. Like I think that when we show up in our masculine, it's really hard for those masculine men to see how you need them. And you might just need them to hold space for you, to make you feel like a woman, and then that's going to help fuel your sexual desire and energy. But the physical, the exercises around that is breathing, it's dance, it's creative energy, it's writing, it's connecting with other women, it's it's being in nature. It's all of those things that you hear about, but those are the things that are attached to the feminine. And this is like the beginning of time. I'm not making up any of this stuff. This is the stuff that's going to fuel you. If you haven't had your feet on the ground, if you haven't walked barefoot in nature, there's a lot of things that go outside every morning and walk on the earth, feel more grounded with the earth. These are the ways that you're going to feel more in touch with your feminine. And so I think that your partner will, will sense that. I mean, I think that with my partner too, and we'll say to each other, we haven't had sex in a while. Like, what's going on? Like, how can we make this happen? And I know, like, we need to, like, switch things up or get out of the house. Or I'm like, well, let me just go for a workout. Let me work out. Let me get outside. Let me walk around the block. You know, let me do these things so I can come back and be be present. And then the masculine and the feminine, it's like yin yang. They they read all our energy. So it's their energy. So the ma it's so hard to, sometimes it can be hard to explain, but, like, the masculine will feed off the feminine. So if I'm bringing the energy, the masculine takes that energy and they, they start to feel that in their body. And it's a you know, circular exchange. It's so damn powerful. Thank you for breaking it down because 
I honestly think this is one of the conversations that people need to have in a relationship. And because me and Tom are so open, as I went from the stay at home wife to then realizing who I was, building my own confidence, this was a subject that I was completely in my feminine all the time. I was yes. completely, I guess, submissive, we would yeah. say. And in finding who I was in becoming like strong and a badass and yeah. building my confidence, my husband loved it, except in the bedroom. And this exactly. was one thing that he literally said. And we had a beautiful conversation because we could be honest, right? But he was like, look, I love you and I understand why. And I'm so proud of you for finding who you are and building your confidence. But I still want to be the masculine one in the relationship and in the bedroom. And so having that honest conversation, I didn't even realize. So when you say yeah. energy, it is so important to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Because in my discussion with him, if Tom hadn't have said anything, I don't know if I would have realized. Mm -hmm. And I think now that I would have brought it to the bedroom without realizing it and now wondering why is there a weird friction between us? Yeah. And I don't know if I would have had the words yeah. to it. But knowing the two and knowing how to go from one to the other, like what you were saying, right? How do you transition? Mm -hmm. How do you go? Because you don't necessarily want to be and maybe you do, so I'm just going to speak for myself. When I'm in my business, I want to be a fucking tough, tough nut. Like, I want to be like, like, you know, that because you're getting, it's like you're getting punched in the face yes, every all the day. All the time, right. It's really hard to make that switch. Yeah, you don't want to be soft. You don't want to be, right, or like more feminine, if you will. It's really, it's, 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 it has to be a conscious effort and it's really hard. And there's days, you know, long days, long hours, and we're just living there. But I think the world needs more of the feminine. I think we need it. I think we're healing. We're nurturing. We are, we give life. We are the life force. And I think that, it, that when the pendulum swings and we're all in our masculine, that we lose a lot of like creativity and love and connection. And I think it's, letting us know that, that that is a safe space too. And it's safe for men to feel things. It's okay for men to be sad. It's okay for men to be express emotions and feelings and to be in their feminine. Right now we're talking about sex, but I think it's just important that for, for men to realize like that's okay too. And then that's how, I mean, I'm sure you and Tom have that. He has times where he's down and you, you do the yin yang and you, you know when he needs you to be maybe in the mask and when he's feeling emotions about something. And we do that naturally maybe in other parts of our relationship, right? But we have to think about it. That's also what's coming into play when you're struggling with arousal and desire in the bedroom. All right, let's get into your feminine. Yes. Go. I could talk to you freaking forever. You're amazing. Everything we just spoke about is in your book, but where can they find you and your amazing book, Smart Sex? Smart Sex. Find uh, Sex with Emily on all platforms. My podcast is released twice a week. You can get Smart Sex wherever you buy books. Take the Smart Sex quiz. Check out our resource guide on the website and have better sex, have smarter sex. Find it everywhere, Sex with Emily. Keep watching my homie to learn the secret to having an amazing orgasm and to have great freaking sex. Um, and so really today, I want to talk about what the difference is between men and women and our sex drive and our libidos. Yes. Well, I think, you know, where you started right there, like the word drive, I think this is how we've all been taught, right? Sex drive puts a lot of pressure, a whole lot of pressure on the whole situation because it's not really a drive, like hunger or thirst, like you're not going to die. But because we put that word sex drive on everything, it makes people feel like, no, but this is something I have to be doing. And that pressure alone, that puts a lot of women out of the mood. Mm -hmm. So just the pressure of like, I have to keep up with my partner or he wants it, therefore, you know, I have to, I have to be turned on. I have to be doing more. That kind of pressure. I always, you know, the round Valentine's Day bring up this conversation because just the idea of Valentine's Day and that you're supposed to have sex on that day or, you know, be intimate in any way, that puts a lot of people out of the mood. And that's a very common feeling. Mm. Also on your wedding night, that's the other yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> wedding nights, anniversaries, anytime there feels like it becomes a sex expectation, that's when people are like, yeah. And, and it's not just women, but it can be men too. But we see a lot of women who are like, now that I feel this pressure, I have anxiety about it. Like I'm not, like I'm no longer in the mood because I have this stress. For men, it can also be a situation where they have this pressure, they're feeling um, like they have to perform. Right, because we talk a lot about how, you know, women, their libido and all these things, but what gets left out of the conversation is that society puts a lot of pressure on men. You're supposed to perform, you're supposed to be a stallion in the bedroom, you're supposed to be able to go forever. By the way, the research shows us that women actually don't want you to go forever. That's <laughs> not really- a surprise. I know, what a surprise. <laughs> and, and, and that's where things get tricky, right? Because you're talking about Cosmo, Sex in the City. I mean, I talk about Sex in the City in the book because of course, like so many of us were like, Samantha, teach us, please. Like we did not get this information. 
But when you look at like Cosmo, Cosmo is much like our sex education. It's always very male centered. How to please your man is the headline. Like how to give a better blowjob. How it's always about them. And it's that kind of messaging uh, like there that also puts a lot of pressure on women to feel like, oh, I have to be, you know, not thinking about my pleasure, not thinking about what I like. And some of the tips that they give like are not even like, they're not even what men want or what your partner might want. Sometimes there, you'll see things where it's like, oh, you know, suck as hard as you can on the tip. And like, not necessarily, like someone might not be into that. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, things like, oh, make sure that like you're nibbling his ear. Like, you know, things, even like little benign things like that, like in comparison, mm. it's like, well, maybe that does it for them, but maybe it doesn't. And I think that's the big piece that we're missing is not talking about what do you like? Do you like this? That can be part of the consent conversation. Like consent can be sexy mm -hmm. and also intel so that you're not just, you know, wandering around in the dark, in the dark of like, where, what do you want from me? Dude, I love this so much. The expectation thing is so fire because when you were saying it, I was like, oh my God, we've not only been doing women a disservice, but also the men a disservice. Oh, yeah. Um, so talk to me about that and then, you know, in your book, which is amazing, there's so much information, like I really want to go um, deep into all the stats and the data because it's fascinating to yeah. me because like the first thing was 40% of women have a uh, low libido. Mm, they, yeah, that they'll report that they believe they have low libido. Mm. Yeah, so low libido and inability to orgasm are some of the top sexual complaints that women have. When you get into the research and really understanding what is libido all about, most women don't have a low libido. So I actually say in the book, like, you know, I'll ask patients, like, how does, how does it, like, you're sitting here comparing, like, do you compare your menstrual cycle to, like, your friends and your neighbors, like, your sleep habits and all of that and get all worked up of, like, I must not be more normal because it's not just like them. Why would your, you, you have these variations. Your sexual desire will also have variations as well. And so with sexual desire, you know, everything is, again, from the male perspective. I mean, even medicine has for a very long time been like, the male body is like, this is the archetype. This is the standard which we like compare everything to. And then there's this like inferior model called the female body and it comes from baby making accessories. <laughs> like that is very much, I mean, even in, Horrifying. I mean, so much of like art and, uh, you know, history and medicine, like we have seen that's been the narrative that plays through. And so when it comes to sexual desire, it's very confusing. I feel like um, it's kind of like watching a tennis match in some ways where it's like, oh, you're supposed to be like into him, but not too into him because otherwise, like, what does that say about you? And like, oh, but you want to be, you know, you want to be into it enough, but oh, not too much because like then you're too much like a man, but you should be more like a man and match him. And you're like, what am I supposed to be? Like, I don't even understand. So in reality, when we talk about sexual desire and women and why do women engage in sex, what we know from the research is that while men may more be more inclined to be like sex, orgasm, yes, done, that's, that's what it's about, women will engage in sex not just for the orgasm. Orgasms are great, lots of good reasons to have them, everybody enjoys them, like wonderful. However, women also will enter into sex because they wanna bond, they want to feel intimate with their partner. They want to feel close. Some women, when they're feeling stressed, it's a way to have that safety and to feel connected to someone. And so there's a lot of reasons why we'll enter into sex. And there's a lot of things that can inhibit us from even receiving the signals of sex. So we can talk about, you know, there's this spontaneous and responsive desire. And that's where it gets like male, female, we think of a lot. And then there's like, the things that really hit the brakes and hit the gas pedal, which is the sexual excitation and inhibition model. So spontaneous desire is like sex on the brain, like all the time. So you're like walking around and your brain is constantly serving, just like, is this sex? Is that sex? Like what's sex? And it's, it's primed for that. And that's what we think of like the male archetypes, mm. but not all men are like that. And that is normal. Now on the flip side, there's the responsive desire. And that's where I'm like, I say like, you gotta get going for things to get going. Like your brain isn't necessarily like, oh, sex, sex, sex. It's like, oh, this is nice. Hmm, not sure. Okay, things are going. Oh no, this is really not, okay, I'm in. I'm in, mm -hmm. like, let's do this. And so that is the low libido that most people are describing, saying, oh, I have a low libido when it really is that you have to have stimuli, like it's gonna take stimuli for your brain to start registering sex, for you to start getting into the mood. Whereas the spontaneous person, 
which is you, like people will say like oh my partner the, you know when i talk about this they're more spontaneous and i'm more responsive and like you know that's a problem we're mismatched and i'm like imagine if you were both spontaneous how would you leave the house like that's the <laughs> oh, new relationship you're talking about right like when you're in a new relationship mm, and you're just like right. i'm just thinking about them all the time like yeah, so it's not abnormal to be mismatched with your partner. And it just takes a matter of communicating of like, I'm not going to probably be the person who initiates unless I like set a reminder on my phone to be like, oh, okay, let's initiate. Let's, you know, let my partner likes this. So that's that spontaneous and responsive desire. So I talk about that. There's a whole libido chapter and we've got quizzes and everything to help you understand where you're at. And that's where I take you into understanding you know, do you have sensitive gas pedals or sensitive brakes? Like where, where are you at on that? Mm. So the sexual excitation model, this came from some brilliant researchers who were like, hey, it's not just as simple as a light switch. Go figure, right? Turn them on, turn them off. It doesn't work that mm-hmm. way. So we can have these variations of like, I'm someone who, you know, has like my, it's very easy to like get me accelerated. And there's very few things that inhibit me. So very few breaks for me. And so you're going to be someone who maybe, you know, has, likes to have sex in a car, doesn't mind if somebody, if somebody's going to walk in on you, or maybe that's even exciting for Mm -hmm. you. So, and then there might be on the flip side, the person who has much more touchy breaks and they're like, the thought of my child walking into the room literally has me out of the mood. I can't even think about getting there that's normal. But we have to know, you know, what are, and these are the things that we think of like turn ons and turn offs. But whenever we have this conversation, like, I mean, it's usually around, like, it's usually around things like, did you get them roses? Did you get them chocolate, scented candles, lingerie, and that stuff. It is important for keeping things spicy and interesting and valuing someone. And there's a whole, you know, complex, uh, you know, thing going on over there. But if you have all these breaks engaged, so we were talking about Mm. the uh, you know, picking up your clothes and helping out with chores and all of that, those can be the breaks. So if we think about a neuronal pathway, so the nervous system, because that's like the main sexual organ, by the way, <laughs> everybody's like genitals. And I'm like, but nerves. Okay. It's about the nerves. I love that you said that. Yeah. So if you think about it as like a little, you can think of it like a train track. And if you have like, you know, so we're talking about a heterosexual relationship. She asked you like, okay, can you, can you stop by the store and pick this up for me? You don't do it. Okay. That was a break. Cause that just added a stressor. So we just put a block on the train tracks. Um, you know, you're at home. She needs help with the kids. She asked you to do something. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, give, give me a minute. And you're not helping in some way. That's another break. She tells you like, I have this really hard day. I need to talk about like, I need to talk through this. Oh, I don't have time. The game's on right now. We just hit another break. She goes into the room. She sees that you didn't put any of your clothes in the laundry hamper. That's definitely a trigger for her. Now she has to clean up after you. It's put another burden on her. Get another break. So you, the game's over. You come over to her. You're like, oh, you'd be looking so good. Let me start kissing up on you. I know you like these things. You're sending sexy signals. You're like trying to send the train that you have all of these blocks. It'll never get through. And the brain is like, I can't even hear that. I cannot even hear that right now. Like any under a normal circumstances of like every, all those blocks are removed. That would be like straight line to like sexy time. Mm-hmm. But because you put all of those blocks in place by, you know, not task sharing, inattentiveness, the things that women need, this is like the stuff that's like everything we need to be in the mood is mm-hmm. outside of the bedroom. Mm-hmm. You can't get the sex you want. You can't get to the pleasure you want because of those blockades. Oh my God, I love that so much. That was so good. And the analogy of the train is so beautiful because here's the thing. I think so much of us feel shame. Oh, yes. So let's talk about that because thinking through what really gets in the way of um, couples really just embracing each other, having a beautiful relationship, it really does become these slight differences that at the beginning maybe you don't see, maybe mm-hmm. you don't realize, maybe you don't know, and then maybe it gets... Um, you don't address it and then it can get worse. And then especially when it comes to women and then the shame of their body, the shame of not being able to orgasm, Mm -hmm. is there something wrong with me, right? You wrote the whole book, is this normal? Very much based on that idea of how much we think it's about us and how we think we're, it's abnormal. And then because of that, we then have the shame. And then the shame becomes the thing that ends up being the biggest sex killer. Absolutely, no, shame is like, 
I, I'd be pressed to find anyone who hasn't been taught to be ashamed for their body in some way. Even if they had the most sex positive, period positive parents who like, you know, embrace them in their home, they're still walking around in a society that's telling them like, oh, periods are yucky and your body, you have discharge. Oh, that's gross. I mean, even uh, if you remember when Cardi B's WAP came out and their commentary on it of men, um, I think it was Ben Shapiro who was like, WAP, that's a medical condition. You should really get it checked out. And I'm like, WAP is not a medical condition. Like that is not like, that is not, I even wrote about that in the book where I'm like, because I had so many people writing me saying, and I was like, where is this coming from that people think that because they can self lubricate and that they have copious amounts of self lubrication, like not a problem, but they thought it was a problem. They thought that something was, was wrong with them. It's even little things like that that can send women into a spiral in their mind thinking, oh my gosh, like, am I too wet? When has, a, when has a man ever complained about someone being too wet? And if they if they do, like, just kick them. You don't need them. Like, they're mm -hmm. out. Boot them. But you're so right about the shame piece. And body image issues can not only put you out of the mood, but it can stop your arousal. So you can be aroused. You can be into it. And then you can fall into the spectatoring, which is where you basically are on the sidelines watching yourself in the act, being like, oh God, do they notice my roles in this position? Oh God, is my cellulite showing? Like, oh, I wonder if this light is showing my stretch marks, like all the things that we've told we should be insecure about, which are totally normal to have on normal bodies. And you get in your mind. You cannot have an orgasm unless you're present. And you will find that like, okay, things now start to get dry. I'm like not as much into this. Mm. Now you're like, something's wrong with me. Why can't I have enough lubrication? Why am I not orgasming yet? And so it can really become this spiral. And I think for women to understand that men's brains are flooded with so many feel-good hormones while, during sex, they cannot pay attention to how your rolls look or how your cellulite, like they can't, they don't have the capacity for it. And if anybody is like, if anybody is doing that, they don't, you have to ask the question, do they really deserve to be having sex with you? Like, do they? I love that so much. This is so fascinating. Okay, so let's keep going down the orgasm part. Because if, if we really believe, okay, orgasm is amazing for a relation. In fact, mm -hmm. let's start there. What's the benefits of orgasms? Oh, what are not the benefits of orgasms, Ooh. right? <laughs> so orgasms are great for decreasing stress. They can, they release hormones that have anti-aging capacity. So um, the secret to living longer is good sex and lots of pleasure. I mean, Pleasure is so important to our health that the World Health Organization says like pleasure should be part of these health conversations. Um, it's something that gets overlooked a lot that, you know, because that myth of like women, women don't enjoy sex as much as men. Women, they have, a, they can't orgasm. I mean, but clearly like men want to help us get there because it's one of the top searched. Um, if you go into Google, how to make a woman come is like one of the top search terms. So. It's clearly something that uh, is on the top of people's minds. So, you know, the inability to orgasm can be related to all kinds of issues. So like the fear of pregnancy being one, if you don't want to be pregnant, especially in our current political state in this country, that'll definitely put you out of the mood and can make it so that you're not able to become aroused or even have an orgasm. Anything that distracts your mind. So if you are someone who's neurodivergent, you're, you're, you can get distracted. Neurodivergent? Neurodivergent. So if you have like ADHD or autism, mm -hmm. you're on um, in either of those camps. It is, so sex can become very redundant and repetitive. Like we, so if we talk about, um, you know, having vaginal penetration, it's like, you know the moves, you know your partner's moves, you know how everything's going to happen. And the brain can be like, this again, this is so boring. This is like commuting, like, and like, we don't even know how we got to work, like when we're commuting, because like, we just leave our mind and leave our body, like people can get really distracted. So that's something else. Like if you're not present, you're not mindful. That's why in the book, I'm like, you might have to spice it up. Like maybe you need to try to play with your senses. You need to bring in feathers or you need to bring in like different textures, like lace or temperatures, like ice or something that is warming. Be careful down there with anything that's like warming, but you might need different things because your mind is getting distracted. And that is a normal experience. I think people don't want to talk about that, about how like sometimes I get bored during sex. Sometimes I get distracted. 
that happens and that's where we need to communicate mm -hmm. but then we go back to the shame piece and it's like well do we talk about this like they, we all do this but do we actually talk about it and so you know to talk about the benefits of orgasms for women they're so important for keeping the health of the vulva and the vagina the pelvic floor um the clitoris is a use it or lose it organ you can have clitoral atrophy, so we do want to be stimulating it. And that's why we have guides in the book for toys. And because if you don't have a partner, you can have a solo session and make sure you keep up the health of your vulva. Um, and then, you know, there's been some research showing that it can help with immune system function. So having orgasms, having a good session, that can help with your immune system so that your immune system is just better equipped to do its job. It can also help with optimizing your hormones around your menstrual cycle. And in the case of period sex, it may even shorten the period a bit so that your period's not as long. It can relieve period cramps. So lots and lots of benefits. Oh my God. Okay. So now <laughs> that you've listed that, that was amazing. Um, why the hell do 80% of women fake it? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, the top reason is it's an altruistic behavior. It's an altruistic deceit where they deceive their partner because they want their partner to feel good, right? Because the narrative in society is that the man is like, he can please any woman, he can go forever, he can like, you know, he's supposed to do all of these things and be a performer in the bedroom, right? And, and pleasing women is definitely something that men are told that they should, they should know how to do. Nobody's teaching them about the clitoris, but they are expected to please a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a big reason. It's also a way to um, opt out. <laughs> so once, you know, things are going, you don't want to... Um, you're like, there's no amount of communication that's going to help me here. This is just bad. Like, and I don't know what to do here. And I, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings, but I want to get out of this situation. So women will fake orgasms for that reason. Um, sometimes there's pain and they just want their partner to stop. And they're like, okay, this is how I'll get them to stop like quicker. And it's not usually a situation because people are like, oh, women are just trying to trick men. They're usually trying to make that man feel good, satisfy that man and get their needs met. And so they're trying to find like, what is the best way to do that? But unfortunately, this is what is part of, you know, what contributes to the orgasm gap, mm -hmm. uh, which is the differential between heterosexual men and women having orgasms. 95% of men having orgasms, 65% of women having orgasms. And people will always come in and argue with me and say, well, it's just because it's so difficult to make a woman orgasm. It's like near impossible. And I'm like, but there have been studies showing that if she does it herself, she can get there in four minutes. So no, like 95% of women can orgasm on their own. And, you know, that's based on studies of self-reporting. So we have to ask the question of like, how accurate and what's the influence around that. But we also know in lesbian couples, it's over 85% are orgasming. So, okay, there's a big deferential there and it's knowledge of the clitoris. Is that because women just like, I know your body because I know mine? Or is it women are more comfortable talking to other women? And so if you're in a lesbian relationship, you're just more comfortable in telling them what your pleasure is. And then to your point that 95% of women masturbate will come. So the fact that only 65% of straight women come, but if you mm -hmm. masturbate, it's 95%. Yeah. There's a big gap between having sex with someone and then doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. So going back to the fake it thing, I think it's both. We're maybe not telling our partner. And then yeah. also our partner thinks that they're pleasing us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, so and then you don't get the pleasure you want, right. which is the crime. <laughs> so what do you think about the lesbian then, the 86%? Why do you think that they're able to have more uh, orgasms than in a heterosexual relationship? Well, I think if you're a vulva owner, finding the clitoris is much easier because you understand, like you understand the anatomy. And even if you haven't looked down there, I have had people ask me like, well, you know, it's crazy how many women haven't looked, so can they not find the clitoris? I'm like, it is not a, it is not a C organ, it is a fill <laughs> organ, like you don't have to see it to know where so it is true. Oh, my God, that's so true. <laughs> oh it's very true i mean and everybody mm. like who's watching can leave us a comment and let me know is that true like is that a fact you know, that it is a feel organ so um so with that i think that's a, just being acquainted with the anatomy already understanding it having masturbated yourself you're going to understand so 
even if you show a man where the clitoris is, um, I have seen things online. Please, nobody search my browser history in writing this book because I'd be like, where are people getting this information from? Google it. And it opens up and the, the website seems legit and it has text and then I scroll down and I'm like, I did not consent to this. Like, what just happened? <laughs> um, so yes, there is information online that's like, oh, women love it if you strum it like a guitar string. Oh, you want to tap it. Like things that I'm like, where, like, why are men asking men? for this for this advice and you see all these men on social media being like men if you want to please women this is how i'm like you need to sit down sir okay you are not the expert on the vulva like let's let a woman stand up but like in reality you need to ask your partner so it may very well be that women feel more comfortable having those conversations as well your book is just so full of gold girl it was like what is it? Two out of three people, uh, millennials, um, are too embarrassed to even say the word clitoris. Oh, vagina. Vagina. Yeah, vagina. I mean, most sex educators won't say the word vagina. They'll say the penis, penis all day, every day, but they will not say vagina. Um, even uh, Grey's Anatomy, the TV show. Yeah. They came up with the word vajayj because they didn't want to say vagina. They did not want to say it, but they said penis like over like yeah. it was like over 150 times in an episode, but would not say vagina. So I think that we're also like I'm always trying to be like, how did we get here? Yeah. Like I think we also are the contributors to not saying it out loud, not repeating mm -hmm. the word as if like this should. I mean, there should be zero shame around it. Yeah. Um, and then um, I think I believe you said, like, is it Freud that basically screwed us all? This dude, <laughs> man. the worst, like, right? Literally, yeah. So if you don't mind explaining, I had no idea. And then yeah. we're like. Oh, this is why I always thought there's something wrong with me because I thought I should absolutely be able to orgasm through penetration. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I can't, then there's definitely something wrong with yes, me. Yes, yes. Well, and let me ask you, like, what were you taught in sex ed? Like, what was your Nothing. sex education like? I don't even remember having sex ed. <laughs> the only thing I remember, my grandmother, my Greek grandmother, told me a child was bought through a stalk. Oh, like wow. The, yeah. The, the old, there was that accurate. old school. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very accurate. And then really, it was nothing no education and then i remember one day all of a sudden my mom showing me how a tampon a tampon works by yeah. putting it under a tap and she's like and this is what happens and it expands and i'm like and what do you want me to do with that <laughs> i know and where does that go that was it yeah that was it until my late i was already having sex i was yeah. in a relationship and i was already having sex before i even looked down there yeah yeah so you want to talk about why i also was faking it yeah because i was I was too ashamed. I was like, you watch the movies mm -hmm. and this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And for a lot of people when they're in, you watch the movies, that is like so true, right? But for a lot of people in sex ed, vagina is taught as like babies come out, penises go in and is very male centered. Mm -hmm. It is very male centered. And that's how a lot of things get taught. And so we are taught that the vaginal orgasm is like the end all be all, right? That started with Freud. So he said the clitoral orgasm is infantile. And what you should be trying to achieve is a vaginal orgasm. Well, who does that serve? That serves a penis. That doesn't serve women. The penis and the clitoris are the same tissue, but the penis has the job of ejaculating and passing urine. So it has other functions. Clitoris does not have the same job. So therefore, it gets to be very, very sensitive. Its only job is pleasure. Like, that's it. So we've got like 100% pleasure organ, then we've got pleasure, plus we got to pass things through an organ over here. And we have no problem accepting that like, oh, you have to simulate a penis to make a man mm, orgasm. Mm. So why wouldn't we accept that you have to simulate the exact same tissue, the female component, to make a woman orgasm? So it did start with Freud. And I want to say, you know, you're saying like, oh, we're to blame for that. I really think a lot of medicine and sex education is to blame for that. I mean... In medicine, they removed the clitoris from anatomy texts. They just made it non-existent. Um, it, medicine wasn't even acknowledging the clitoris until a couple decades ago. And forever, and still, it's it was like, like... the 80s or something, or the yeah, 90s, you're like, that's the when 90s. it was discovered. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, discovered. It was discovered, no, it was like 1800s it was discovered, but it was like, I call it the clitoral conspiracy. It was like a clitoral conspiracy <laughs> to keep this information, because how dare women have pleasure? Oh my goodness, like that's not what it's about. And I think that if, uh, so, you know, so often the narrative is like, men have to have an orgasm, that's how babies are made. And if people thought women have mm -hmm. to have an orgasm, that's how babies mm -hmm. are made, then it would be more of a priority. But because it's not, it's like, mm, whether or not that happens doesn't matter because, you know, as long as there's ejaculate delivered, we can get to baby. Mm -hmm. And that is highly problematic because it is just 
reducing women time and again to their reproductive capacity, which we are so much more than that. Mm, yeah, so true. Okay, so we spoke about the health benefits of orgasms and then what actually then holds us back from actually being able to orgasm. So mm -hmm. it was the word like, number one, okay, well, if you fake it, how the hell is your partner supposed to yeah. actually get you there? I think that that's going to be a big thing. Um, hormones, so let's talk about hormones of how mm -hmm. that can also be a something that can get in our way. Oh, yes. So whenever people they are like, I have a low libido, I have difficulty orgasm, whatever the sexual dysfunction is, they jump right away to like, it must be my hormones. It can be your hormones, but it is often other things going on as well. Because once, I mean, so let's say like it starts with hormones. Let's say it starts with low estrogen. It can be um, estrogen issues because you're postpartum, because you're in menopause. Um, being on oral contraceptive pills can also mess with vaginal ecology as well and your ability to self-lubricate. And so low, low estrogen is going to be problematic because it can lead to tissue atrophy, difficulty self-lubricating. The tissue can become more sensitive, more friable. So if it's extreme, you can go to the bathroom, you can wipe, and then you're gonna find that there's blood on the tissue. Like that's how extreme that it can get. And without estrogen, we can't produce the glycogen, the sugar that feeds the good organisms in the vagina. So now we're gonna be predisposed to yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis, and then those are gonna be problematic. So all of these hinder your sex life. And with shrinking tissue, of course, that's gonna affect your ability to orgasm and you're gonna need lubrication. But then we have all this shame about lubrication, right? Like, oh, you're not, you're not supposed to use that. You should be able to like self-lubricate, which is, not always the case. I mean, depending on where you are in the cycle, if you are a week before your period, it's a dry time. You're going to have a harder time self-lubricating because of where your hormones are at. Your progesterone's up, your estrogen's taking a back seat to that, and that's completely normal. So you have that piece. Now, if you aren't, you know, you aren't using lubrication, the tissue is becoming inflamed, there's infections, um, which these are normal organisms that live there, but they become imbalanced. Now, when you have sex, there's an association with pain, you can have pain, discomfort, you're not having an orgasm. Now you're in your head about that, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to have pain or you've had pain in the past, so you have a fear. Now you're trying to have pleasure, but there's a fear around the pleasure. And so that's just one example of one hormone and how it can affect you. But I think where everybody usually goes in their mind is testosterone. Is that where you went? Oh, and... Um I wasn't sure to be honest because my thing went to hormones like oh, okay you just don't feel in the your chemicals aren't yeah. pumping that's kind of how I mm -hmm. like blanketed it in my head um but then now to your point of well if even if your hormones are you're not being self-lubricated as much mm -hmm. it's the mental thing that really freaking screws you because yeah. the second you get in your own head about oh my god I'm not as wet mm -hmm. now my husband doesn't think I'm turned on by him yeah right because now he, I worry, he may not worry, but I worry. Yeah. He's interpreting this as I'm not into him. Mm -hmm. And now my mind goes into the whole thing. And so that was why I thought then I wouldn't be able to orgasm. Yeah. Because of the, the way the hormone would impact my mind. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the testosterone versus the estrogen. Well, and testosterone and estrogen, they really are like the go um, on, the sex, on the sex pedals. They're like, let's go. Mm. Progesterone is like, we're good. Because mm. progesterone rises after ovulation. So progesterone is basically like, you had your chance to go collect some, some semen and get pregnant. We did the egg thing. We're done here. And that is where the phase of your cycle where you're like, you know what? I, I'm really rather get into sweatpants than get into their pants. Like I am good right now. And that's the progesterone. And so testosterone, we, people, I mean, I will sometimes get men who write me and they're like, you need to fix my woman's testosterone because she's not in the mood. And I'm like, you, um, you probably need to tend to, to your home life. And it's, it's more than just testosterone, but low testosterone is associated with low sexual desire. Um, you can have difficulty orgasming and it can be involved in the arousal process as well. But we, it's something that I do see low testosterone in women, but it's more common postmenopausal in really high times of stress. It's not usually the main thing that's going on in terms of like what I commonly see. And people are always surprised by that. Um, the birth control pill can definitely tank testosterone. That can be a reason why you have low sexual desire, which is ironic because you're on the pill so that you can have sex and that is getting rid of that inhibition, which is the fear of having a baby if you don't want one. But then the way it changes your hormones can make it so that you're not in the mood. And you're like, I have yeast infections and my vagina is not self-lubricating and I have no testosterone. So like, I'm not into this. Mm. But 
with testosterone, for people who are curious about it, um, you know, it's always beyond the low libido. So you'll have lack of motivation, you'll cry really easily. Um, that kick ass feeling, you won't have that anymore. That like ability to set boundaries, kick ass, like have a great day. Your energy is gonna be lower, you're gonna be more fatigued, you're gonna see that you have muscle mass wasting, so you'll have less muscle mass, it'll be harder to change your body composition, so you'll have a propensity towards more fat cells and less muscle cells like in the body. That's how things will shift. And so it's not usually just a low testosterone mm. goes low libido and no other symptoms. You're going to have other symptoms with that as well. Um, but you're absolutely right in terms of like the hormones do affect brain chemistry. They absolutely do influence um, as we see throughout the menstrual cycle. So for example, when testosterone and estrogen are up, you are going to be more likely to fantasize. So you're gonna be running fantasies in your mind. Um, you're more likely to be in like the grocery store checkout line, see a magazine and your brain to register sex. Your brain to be like, hmm, yes, that fellow looks good or she's looking good. Like, and your brain is going to interpret like that's sex, like I'm, I'm into this. And so um, the hormones do absolutely play a role, but I think it's very short-sighted for us to only mm. be talking about hormones. I say that as a hormone doctor mm. in that it's just women are much more complex than that. And while uh, I do think the hormones should be evaluated, I think there's a holistic approach in this conversation that often gets missed by a lot of practitioners. So what would you say are the holistic things that we need to, or we can be doing in these situations? Mm. I will tell you as a hormone doctor who is in a relationship, who's been married for over a decade, um, working on your hormones is easier than working on your relationship. And so oh, I think wow. that's, <laughs> that's a bold statement. <laughs> it is very true. I mean, it's so much easier to be like, I'm going to shift my diet. I'm going to get better sleep, like do these things because it's only you. You just have to be accountable yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. And I see this all the time with patients where they're like, let's just fix my hormones. I'm like, but maybe you need to talk about your relationship. And they're like, oh, like that. I mean, it can definitely be work. It is definitely something that can be um, intense because now we have a dynamic and we have to unpack our stuff and they have to unpack their stuff and then you're putting it on the table together and now you've got to sort through it mm -hmm. and like and then how how is your parents like how is their relationship like how have your past relationship like it just becomes so complex and there's so much to it and so working on relationships that can't be understated and working on your communication as well if you can't talk to someone outside the bedroom about sex, how can you talk to them in the bedroom about sex, about what you want and how to get that pleasure? So there's that component. I think we also need to be looking at things like chronic conditions. So I think it's, uh, I think it's something that is widely dismissed in women. Um, are, it's autoimmune disease and any kind of chronic mm. health issue where they struggle for years, exhausted, pushing through. Like I, you know, we have similar stories in that way of like really struggling with autoimmunity, being dismissed. And that is something that if your body's in survival mode for any reason, even if it's just because you have a stressful job, you're not going to want to be in the mood. You're going to have a harder time having pleasurable sex because your hormones are shifting for survival. So your cortisol is now coming up. You're, you're, you're shifting like, you know, chill out progesterone, which I said can like block you in the bedroom. But yet if you don't have enough of it, you're more critical of your partner. You're more stressed out. You can't get good sleep at night. And so it's taking a look at like you as a whole person, the environment that you live in, your health practices, and what is your what is your relationship like? And so we have to look at all of those layers to really understand, you know, do you have a dynamic that is maybe impeding you in the bedroom? Or is that fine? And like what we're dealing with is inflammation, which is taking your testosterone and turning it into estrogen. And now you're feeling cranky and swollen and bloated. And that's not a sexy feeling. That's like not a good feeling at all. And so we really have to dissect that out and understand what is the root cause for you? What's true for you? while also teaching the components of what we started at the top with of like spontaneous and responsive desire, understanding your gas pedals and your brakes, like understanding these things because sometimes people think they're not normal when in reality, they're totally normal. It just doesn't look like it does on TV. Mm. Oh my God, that was so good, girl. So like, you know, in your book, you break down like you just did, but you've got, you know, the age, the hormones, the stress, the mm -hmm. inflammation and 
going back to what you were just saying, my gut issues were going on for years. Yeah. And so you want to talk about I wasn't in the mood, yeah. but I, it really impacted my um, connection with my husband. Mm-hmm. And so because I've built my relationship on pure honesty, that was a very hard conversation to have. But to your yeah. point of the communication where I sat down with him and was like, look, it's painful for me. Mm-hmm. And he was, and of course, my husband's such a gentleman. He was just like, I would, like, no, yeah. we're not doing anything. Like, babe, we need to make sure that your health is okay. And I was like, but I need, I, we may not be able to have intercourse right yeah. now, but I need that connection with you. And he's always so generous. He's just like, yeah, but it can't, it shouldn't just be one way. Because mm-hmm. like, he never felt good about it just being his pleasure. Yeah. It was always, a, you know, for both. Yeah. And I said, I understand, but actually right now, because I don't know if I can, orgasm I don't know if I use those words but I Mm. I don't think I can get to that but I still need to feel that connection I still want to be intimate with you and now what does this intimacy look like in a different way Mm -hmm. um, where maybe I can pleasure him and things like that but to your point of my gut was inflamed and then I was very stressed out and I was just tired all the time and you know um, we then feel shame around that yeah like I'm unable to please my partner absolutely and what's important in what you shared is so many people's definition of sex is a penis goes in the vagina. Mm. Like there has to be penetration. And that's why I wrote a whole chapter on sex of all kinds, because there's all kinds of ways to be intimate. I have patients who have uh, significant endometriosis. Um, They cannot have penetration. It is very painful for them that they can engage in oral sex or Mm -hmm. outer course. I mean, things that sometimes people think are like, that's some high school juvenile stuff. That's incredibly pleasurable for some people. And so there's lots of ways to connect. And if you look at the research, when people report sexual satisfaction, orgasm is actually lower. It's not one of the top things. Um, Feeling empathy, feeling connected to somebody, um, actually feeling that intimacy, that's what makes for a pleasurable session no matter what you're Mm -hmm. doing. And so I think, you know, we talk a lot about the orgasm and everybody wants to try to get an orgasm. And it is, I think, something that is important to have conversations about, but I think it's important for people to understand that that lots of people have very satisfying sessions, sexual experiences, and never have an orgasm in that session, and they still rate it very high, but it's because of the connection. So what you're talking about there of like, the radical honesty, I mean, it really is radical in like our society, right? To be that honest, you know, that kind of connection, um, being intimate with someone, just wanting to feel close to them, like doing it for those reasons results in much more satisfaction than somebody going in and just being like, we're just gonna get this done so that we can get to orgasm and like be done with it. Mm -hmm. People report less satisfaction in those Mm -hmm. sessions. And um, I think women need around 14 minutes of yeah. foreplay and men only need like five yeah yeah men don't sometimes I was like, wow even five's high <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes you're just like bending down in the sh- in the freezer like getting something out and they're like let's go let's go right now right because again the brain is like hey, sex sex yeah, sex yeah. surveying that um and some women are like that too um and then they get told that like oh you're too much like a man and i'm like you're all good Mm. We're all good, like whatever is working for you. But for women, yeah, I tell my patients, like give it 20 minutes to warm up. Give it 20 minutes to warm up. And, you know, as we were talking about lubrication before, um, there's a phenomenon known as arousal non-concordance. And so in the research, they're like, why is it that like, like some women, it's like their brain is like showing they're turned on, but like their genitals are not turned on. Mm. Like what's going on? Mm. The brain is what gives consent and the brain is the one to listen to. If you say yes and the genitals look like they're saying no because they're not getting the memo. The brain's like, we're really into this. And the genitals are like, huh? What? What's going on? And so they're not getting as, uh, you know, as engorged. We're not seeing um, as much lubrication. Like, that's happening. Nothing's wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Again, a case for lube. So nothing's wrong with you in that situation. And yet the brain sometimes surveys things. So um, I've had on my social media, Ask Dr. Brayton, a question that came up a lot, um, which I found really interesting is women saying, I don't know what to make of it. I'll be scrolling through my feed on social media and I'll see someone doing a suggestive dance or doing something and I feel aroused. Like my, my genitals feel aroused. They don't say genitals. They're usually like my clitoris, like I feel my clitoris or like my vulva like feels juicy, like, you know, using that kind of language. And they're like, and sometimes it's someone of the other gender. Like, am I bisexual? Am I actually gay? Like what mm-hmm. is actually going on here? And I'm like, that is just your brain being like, oh, sex. And the genitals are like, sex, you said sex, okay. And then you're self-lubricating, like you feel this stirring in your nether region, Mm -hmm. so to speak. 
that is that is something as well that if the brain if you're like wait i'm not into this you're not into this that's a no it doesn't mean that you're switching genders it doesn't mean you're suddenly attracted to that person it doesn't mean you want to cheat on your partner or anything like that the brain just said hey this is sex the genitals were like yes sex love it here for it and then you caught yourself and said Mm -mm, I'm not actually into this. The brain is in control there. So if you give consent, but the genitals aren't following, it's still consent. If you say no, and the genitals are doing something else, they're just like, I'm already on this train, friend. Like, we're just going that way. But your brain says no, that's not consent. Wow, I love that you broke that down. And I assume men are not the same. Um, so here's the thing, men can, so th this is like, th there's so many jokes and we, the, get, the arousal non-concordance gets talked about a lot more. So I, right, we have, um, oh, I'm really into her, but I can't get erect. And it's not necessarily erectile dysfunction. There can be other reasons for that. That's an arousal non-concordance. There are times where, um, you know, especially like uh, as someone who has a young boy, I'm like, these moments are going to come where they're at the din dining room table and the brain picked up something mm -hmm. as sex and they don't even know why and now they have an erection, but they're not, it, they're not turned on, like they're not into this. And so it can definitely happen with men as well. Um, but you know, a lot of times if men are in the mood and they're like, I want to have sex, then their penis is erect and then they're able to have sex, right? And so mm -hmm. I think um, with us, it, things are a lot more complicated. I love that you brought broke that down because as you were talking I'm like I'm just going to be honest like this is just weird for me to say out loud because I'm a little sh I was brought up when you never talk about sex yeah, yeah, so yeah. even this discussion I freaking love but this little part of me is a little embarrassed but I'm just going to say it, like you're 100% right I can't remember what I was watching it was like some show and they had gay sex and I was like why am I turned on yeah, yeah. it was like it's not that I want to be a part of ma man on man sex like yeah, I, yeah. I but so I was very confused. Yeah. And so I turned to my husband. He's like, no, I'm not turned on. And he ha didn't have, he wasn't hard. Yeah. So I'm like, this is very confusing for me yeah, because yeah. I'm not injured. But it didn't seem That's like. That's really common, by the way. Mm. It's super common. And most people don't say it out loud. No. But um, the homosexual sex, there's a lot of women who will watch that pornography. They are very turned on to, um, to it. Uh, part of that can be because it feels like a safer situation as a woman than watching. Like, because when it is heterosexual sex, that is, again, very male-centered and the way that, you know, sometimes things are being done. A woman is like, I'm not, I, there's a lot that's being done sometimes in pornography that women are like, that's not actually something I'm into. It's like why we have to have these conversations because if men are learning their moves from porn, they're not really learning moves. Like they're learning things mm -hmm. that like stimulate their brain and give them the stimulation they need. Um, but as a woman watching that, it's just like, yeah, I don't, that looks like that hurts. Like, you know, I don't really want to do that. Or like, why are they doing that? And so that's why some researchers believe women are more inclined to watch gay uh, pornography. And so watching men, sometimes they'll watch women as well, but men seem to be like a really safe one. Wow, that's, I never dawned on me that was the reason. Um, and then it can somewhat, the be, I mean, I've said this a couple of times in this interview, it can be somewhat confusing for a guy. Yeah. Where, because to us, based on exactly what you just said, there's a massive difference between the fantasy and the reality. Mm -hmm. The fantasy, I'm like, you just want to keep it as a fantasy. You don't yes, actually want it. Yeah. But I, so I don't know, do guys do that? But also it is confusing for guys because my husband was like, but you just said that was a fantasy. And I'm like, but babe, I don't actually want don't it. Don't actually want it, yeah. No, uh, so lots of people have fantasies about threesomes. They'll even fantasize about it like while they're having sex with their partner, that they never want to have a threesome. They just like the idea of it. And so... Fantasies, sometimes people, they keep their fantasies private. Um, sometimes they want to share it with their partner and sometimes they do want to act them out. Maybe they have a fetish that they would like to try. All of that is normal. And you know, when it comes to keeping your fantasies to yourself, sometimes that is what you need to make it hot, to make it mm. something that you're into. And so um, I've had women ask me, like if I'm thinking about someone else, like while I'm having sex with my partner, does that mean I'm cheating? It's not cheating. It's not cheating if you're fantasizing about somebody else being present, somebody else being engaged with you. But the thing I caution people is that if you are only thinking about someone else the mm -hmm. entire time while you have sex with this person, then you really have to ask, are you using this person as a means to an end just to have sex? Or are you actually wanting to have that intimacy and that connection? Because that's not fair. That's not fair for you to be like, I just want to engage this body while I go somewhere else with my mind. But it is not uncommon for women 
to have all kinds of different fantasies running in their mind um, and especially helping them get to orgasm. And sometimes you need that because the distractions of like, oh, there's a noise in the house or Mm -hmm. I have children in the house or you know, maybe somebody like might um, hear us at a hotel or, you know, those kinds of fears. Sometimes you have to go into fantasy land to be like, I need to like escape that. And that actually helps you get present with what's happening in the situation, which seems odd to be like, I have to go into fantasy to be present in my mm. body, but it's so that you're not constantly hit all, by all these distractions. Oh my God, that's really powerful um, because I never really thought about it like that. And you kind of, when, when you don't have an expert like you to talk to, right? Like you get in your own head about what does this mean? Does, you know, but I'm turned on, but I'm thinking yeah. about someone. Like it, it's very confusing for women. And then mm-hmm. again, the second you get in your own head, it's like, are you able to be present to then yeah. actually enjoy that moment? Once you get in your head, it's like so hard to come oh, back, dude, right? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, and you said it earlier. Um, and maybe this is just like the very straightforward question. So if a guy is listening right now, how the hell do you make a woman come? Ah, you ask her. <laughs> so that's like number one. But um, so based on the research there, we have very little studies in women's medicine and then very little studies into women's sexual health. Um, but we do have some research and every woman um, who owns a vulva um, will understand this, that rhythmic motion. So first touching the clitoris in a rhythmic mo- motion slow and low is the tempo like we want to keep it (laughs) i just quoted the beastie boys right now but (laughs) slow and low is the tempo so so you want to start with you know like not not like super light pressure we're not trying to tickle but we don't want to go super firm so it's going to be slowly moving like your hand towards the clitoris and then low and slow movement um and you want to be rhythmic and so most women prefer either circular or back and forth um you can use one finger but most women prefer two or even um all your fingers or the palm of your hand um you can retract the clitoral hood you can ask her to retract the clitoral hood but as you're doing this asking is this good? Do you like this? Do you want more of this? Mm -hmm. And I think the hard part is that as you get excited as the, as the person stimulating the clitoris, not to then speed things up or start changing things up. And I think that's, um, you know, sometimes when men are about to climax, they speed things up and they go faster. And so like the, they're like, this is my experience. So maybe this is what's good for you as well when that's not always the case. And so communicating. So that's manual stimulation. Mm -hmm. But I hear from people that are like, but I want to make her come while we're having sex. Like I want to have, like I want to achieve that vaginal orgasm that Freud talked about. And so, (laughs) (laughs) so with that, there is research to show that if she orgasms before penetration, she is more likely to have an orgasm during penetrative sex. And while most men in, you know, understand that to be true is that they have a they have a very long refractory period so that means once they orgasm they're not able to just go round two right away and so they'll think like oh that must be the same for her like once she orgasms it's gonna be harder to get her there not true we have a shorter refractory period again the clitoris is always giving and mama nature knew what she was doing and so you can stimulate her she can orgasm then you can go into penetration she is more likely to orgasm she may even have multiple orgasms. And while you're penetrating, you still want to stimulate the clitoris. So you can try different positions. She can do it herself. You can do it yourself. You can put a pillow under her hips in missionary so that things are more exposed. Or you can bring toys in. Mm-hmm. And this is where men will say like, oh, I don't want to have to compete with a toy. It is not a competition. I'm like, you're Batman? And that is literally your utility belt. Like you just pull out <laughs> from the utility belt. Like what is it going to be? Cock ring, vibrator, like what do you want? Like what works for you? And so you should be seeing it as an ally. It's not competing with you in any way. And it is going to make things more pleasurable. And in fact, like with some men, I'm like, well, have you ever like tried having any vibration present? No, no. I'm like, it works for you too. Like it is, it is it's, it's mm-hmm. going to help you too. So um, those are just some of the things that you can do. But like the number one is you just have to be asking, do you like this? Are you into this? Because even though I'm like, this is what like in general most people like, she may be into something different. That's amazing. I love how you broke that down. And as you're talking, it's like we, 
we all make it about ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Right? right? So it's like, if the guy is able to get her to orgasm, he feels good. If he's able to get her to multiple orgasm, he feels great. If he's mm -hmm. able to get her to multiple orgasm and squirting, he feels like a freaking yeah, stud. Right? <laughs> right? And so it's almost like, it's you got me here. Yeah. And then vice versa for women. Like there is, I remember where it was like, oh, can't get hard oh my god what have i done wrong? yes oh my right? god i must be bad oh my god i can't turn you on yeah. it is me i'm the one and now thinking about the guy like i'm always trying to see it from both sides of it yeah. like even though we've been you know had our own rough time of it i do think of it like within well, that's actually i feel bad for the guy as yeah. well because now you're making it about yourself and then as a woman you're like am i not sexy enough am i not yeah. turning you on off and then the guys think probably thinking no it has nothing to do with that mm -hmm. and now everyone gets in their own head and now you're not having this beautiful yeah. like moment that could really have like be beautiful um how do we not make it about ourselves and like help that other person get there and i know you yeah. can probably say communication well but... i think you also have to you know practice throughout the day checking yourself when you start to make things so we're on social media right and somebody leaves us a comment oh my God, like this is about me. Like how is this, like they think this, you know what? People saying nasty things on social media, it's about them. Mm -hmm. Like what kind of person goes onto someone else's page and leaves them hateful stuff? Not a well person, not a well person. But we make those kinds of things about ourselves. So stopping that there. Mm -hmm. Thinking about all the ways that like you already do that in your day to day, you're gonna build that neuronal pathway. So that when you get into that situation, you will have the breaks to be like, wait, Maybe it's not about me. Mm. It's very, very hard. It is a very, I think, as women, we are challenged with almost an impossible task, which is loving ourselves and being confident in our bodies, being confident in our relationships while we are inundated from messages in our society that constantly tell us that we're not good enough, that we are the problem. I mean, even, I mean, we look at marketing from like the 1950s that was like, you, if you want to keep a man, you need to douche. Like literally saying stuff like that. Like, oh, he'll leave the house if it smells down there. And I'm just like, I can tell you're a man writing this. I already know. <laughs> like you're really telling on yourself how little you understand about the female body. Yet that kind of undercurrent of marketing, like that is pervasive, right? I mean, we think about things that are like, oh, you know, this is going to be like the age defying because heaven forbid you live long enough that you get old. Like, what is that? But it's the same way when it comes to sexual health. And, you know, in the book I talked about um, the, you know, the different things that we see. So like um, my so-called life, vampire diaries, like, but for real, like how are vampires getting erections and getting wet? I just don't understand. I don't understand this, um, but we see like all of these TV shows and we see all these things where there's no talk of consent, there's no condom, right? It is just, I, I see you, you see me, like we're making out, ooh, now we're having hot sex, oh, she orgasmed immediately and like everything is perfect. Mm. And so we've got all and of that. And orgasm vag uh, vaginally, yes. not a clitoris. Oh yes, oh yes, it's always like uh, against the wall in like some like all of these positions. And I'm like, but yeah, I think that's probably gonna get in some people's heads about like, wow, okay, like I should be having this wild adventurous sex. And so it's a challenge mm. and we have to acknowledge that it's a challenge. Mm. And the biggest thing is just to build the awareness and awareness and open communication in your relationship. And if you find that there's anything that seems like, oh, this is like, this is not going according to plan, change the plan. So that's why I'm like, here's all of these options of sexual experiences that people have. Like, there are a lot of ways that people find pleasure, they can get off, like there's many ways to, to hit the O um, and there's many ways to just feel connected to your partner. And so even if things, I think that again, it becomes this like, we have to have vaginal penetration for it to be successful. Even the word foreplay, it said, like that word itself indicates that there is something more. You might orgasm with foreplay, you might both be satisfied with foreplay, but because it's called foreplay, the thought is, no, this can't be enough. Like we have to get to the end. We have to arrive at vaginal penetration, which mm. is like not true. Yeah, it's so true. The, the blessing and the curse of porn, like I think porn's getting a really bad rap right oh, now. Oh yes, we can talk about that. Yeah, please, let's do it. Because I think that like anything, it can be great, it can be detrimental. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about where we're potentially setting up women and men for failure, it's there's definitely porn messaging out there yeah. that you can just wham bam, thank you, ma'am, and you're good to go, you know, you're yeah. fine. Um, but then also there is that part of like, 
porn can be pleasurable and mm-hmm. porn can be part of the experience. What if you have different opinions of porn in your relationship? Yeah, well, gosh, I mean, as much as shame and stigma there is on sex, there's tons on mm. porn. Even the fact that we're talking about this right now, there's already going to be people heated in the comments because people feel very passionately. Well, and they usually feel very passionately, they're very much against it. Why and, is that? Well, it's so the equivalent of men feeling they're in competition with a vibrator is how a lot of women feel about porn. They're in competition with that. And there is messaging from other men who are like, porn ruins you in the way that like it will lower your testosterone. It makes it so that you're not self-disciplined. Like all of these, just like why they also are like, you shouldn't masturbate. It'll ruin your hormones. And I'm like, that's false. It's good for your hormones. Men should masturbate or be having ejaculation happening like a dozen times a month for their prostate health. Like we know this, like retention is not the way friends. Um, so with that, I think people, there's a lot of um, religious connotation. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of misunderstanding about porn of why people view porn. There's a lot of money made in the porn addiction industry. Mm-hmm. So there's actually, there's no, no uh, real diagnosis for sex addiction. And yet um, sex addiction, porn addiction, masturbation addiction, there are very, uh, very much many people with that messaging of pushing that out there, making a lot of money off of doing that. And so we've got that messaging Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there is unethical porn. There is there mm. is porn that nobody should be consuming. It should be shut down and it should not ever exist. Um, absolutely those exist. But at the same time, there is ethical porn. There are companies that are being run by women who are paying women fair wages that are making sure that women are protected. And it's really amazing. And I would say that, you know, growing up, I definitely got the message of like, porn is bad. Like I did not have a sex positive family. I had a don't talk about sex. And mm. if you do, we're gonna shame you about it kind of mm. family. Um, and so I got that message as well. When I was practicing in Oakland, California, I had a lot of patients come from the porn industry and I had no idea until I like got into conversations with them and they were all talking about how much they love their jobs, how much they were like families, how it was like so satisfying. And, um, it was really interesting to have conversations with people who were part of the industry and loved it so much. And, um, to really see that like these things that people say about porn, the people who are working like in the production, I mean, women working in the production, women who are actually like the stars, um, all really enjoying their job, all really loving what they do. And so I think, you know, if you look at other societies where they have better sex education, so we just look at like Amsterdam, better sex education, access to sex workers, um, these things are an important part of society and people hate that in the US. They Mm. hate thinking that sex workers have a place in people's health, but people need that connection. People need pleasure. And sometimes that's the only way that they're satisfying things. I think the problem comes is when we're lying about things, we're in a partnership, we're not being honest, like those kinds of things are the problem. Mm. Um, And hiding porn from your partner, I think is also problematic. And that will really seed even further where people are like, porn is problematic. Why would you, why would you hide it otherwise? And it's like shame. Shame is why people hide these things, but you're right. So in, in a partnership, you have to just have this conversation. Um, porn has to be consensual. You have to agree on the type of pornography you're going to watch. And there has to be an understanding that if any one person says, turn it off, you turn it off. Mm. And there, and in anything you do, consent can always be revoked. And if you violate that, that person says, turn it off. And you say, oh, just give it a few more minutes. Da, da, da. Like you just burnt the bridge. You just burnt the bridge. It's done. This person, you have violated their trust in that because they need to be able to feel safe in this. Mm. And so your partner might be like, I can try this for two minutes. And like, then then we're good. I actually have, um, in our house, we have a rule about movies and TV shows. Like if we're going to start something, we're iffy about it. We're like five minute rule, mm. five minute rule. And we'll give it five minutes. And after five minutes, we'll check in. And so that's just movies and TV. You can also do that with porn. Five minute rule. Okay. After five minutes, we're going to check in. Do we want to, is this working for us? Do we want to proceed? And how much do you think that all of this needs to be discussed either before sex is in, before you actually have the act or before you actually start having a sexual experience with another person? Mm. So I think 
so things are going to evolve. So as you start a relationship, you might not even know that you're like, oh, I might want to watch porn or mm, right. I'm really into sucking toes or like any of these. Mm. You might not know that about yourself. And being in this relationship with this person is revealing those things. So as the re- relationship progresses, now you know you're into this thing. Now you want to have the conversation. You want to ideally have that outside the bedroom because this is something where, I mean, there can be trauma and there can be a lot of issues that come up. But if you make for a negative experience, it's going to be harder to come back. That's again, right? Hormones are easier than, than <laughs> relationships coming back from that's going to be so much harder than, um, than talking about it beforehand. So the ideal is before you're in the moment, but sometimes things come up in the moment when that's when your brain is like, we would really like this. We should do this. Mm-hmm. And that's where you ask, like, I would really be into this. Like, do you want to try that? Or, Hey, can I do this with you? Um, you know, things that get labeled as kink is they're actually really common. They sh- like, it's funny that we think like, this is that like CD kink stuff. So like spanking is part of kink. It's really common, really common in relationships for people to enjoy spanking. Do I use that as an example of like, you might be in the moment, you're in a position and you're like, I really want to spank this person. You need to ask first. Mm-hmm. You don't want to just spank someone and you want to start gentle. Again, slow and low, like keep it gentle. Um, and then you can you can ask like, you know, would you like it harder? Like, you know, do you like that? Can I, you know, do you like it when I grab you? Like, you know, these kinds of things like that. You're, you're getting the consent and then you're getting the feedback in real time because you may get excited and think like, oh, this is a really, you know, great thing and I'm really into it and they're into it. But if you're not asking, or they're not giving you the cues and the feedback that is saying like, I am into this, like you're gonna run into a problem. And now nobody's satisfied, everybody's stopping and the fun's done. Yeah, what's happened in your body chemically when that happens? So because I'm thinking through like in that moment where it's really heated, yeah, it's yeah. like, oh my God, this is great. And then the next day you're like, oh, actually it, my, my hormones led me astray and actually it was my body wanting but my mind now regrets it. Oh yeah, that's super common. You know, I actually heard uh, Brene Brown say the vulnerability hangover mm. and I was like, that's exactly what happens after sex. Like she's talking about, oh, you know, talking about intimate things and being vulnerable. And yet during sex, you're so vulnerable. And then you do things, right? You do things and you're like, oh my God, I loved that. That was so great. And then the next day you're like, what does that say about me? And what do they think? And like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And maybe that's a bad thing. And like, oh God, did I hurt my body in a way that I'll never come back from? Like we start to spiral in that way. It can definitely happen. But I think part of it too is that like, when it's just like what people will call vanilla sex, right? Missionary, cis hetero sex, like, that is something that we are told is acceptable, is safe, like is normal. When you deviate outside of that, there is the risk that afterwards you're going to think like, oh gosh, I really wish, I really wish I hadn't done that. Now you may very well be like, I wish I hadn't done that because I actually didn't enjoy it. I actually didn't want it. And that's a different thing. Of course. But yeah. I think that, you know, that, that vulnerability hangover, that after the fact, like I don't have like all this dopamine and all these hormones floating around in my brain anymore, not feeling that anymore. And now afterwards I'm, and, to remember that you are being a historian and going back and looking at the event now from the outside mm. and judging it from the outside rather than the experience in the moment. Like you, you were consenting to these things, you were in the moment, it was good for you in the moment, but now historian you puts on your little spectacles and is like, mm, no, you're a bad person for doing that. Because all of your belief system comes exactly. flooding back in. Yeah. Um, and everyone else's ideas about who you should be comes into play. Right, yeah. Um, what's happening when it's like you like the riskiness of it? And like, so my husband is actually a little conservative. I'm the yeah. one that's like, oh, babe, like there's a beach. There's no one on the right. Like, and, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting <laughs> because growing up, I never perceived that as being the, the, the right, quote unquote, yeah. dynamic. I always thought it's the guy that's adventurous, yeah, yeah. right? And then the woman's like, well, I'm not sure. And then I met my husband and he kind of, not laughed in a bad way, but he was like, wow, you're really freaking kinky. And I'm yeah. just like, yeah, and you're not? Like, and I, it was surprising <laughs> yeah. to me that my husband, again, just being from um, a very traditional background, mm-hmm. I was brought up to think a certain way. And so I actually thought, oh my God, is it normal that I'm the one in the relationship that wants the kinkiness? Yeah, no, it is totally normal. And it's those those exciting things too. So that is, um, the, like, why do people ride roller coasters, right? It's terrible. Your brain's getting all jostled around, like you feel like you're gonna die, and yet here's this cue, like like you know you're waiting for like two hours just to get on and experience that like you know two minutes of 
of just terror, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Like, it's exciting. Like, it's something new. And in relationships, especially relationships that go for a longer period of time, spicing things up, changing things up, finding ways to make ex um, things exciting, that's actually healthy. It's a healthy thing to do. And um, you're a lot of women. There's a lot of women who also get called kinky and things like that. Like they're not supposed to be that mm -hmm. way, but it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what your gender is. Whatever you like and you're into and is happening consensually, that's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel good about myself now. Yeah. Um, and then I'd be remiss to not talk about the whiskey vagina, I think you call it. <laughs> I thought it was so funny if you don't mind talking to me about that. Yeah. Because, um, a, the, I want actually guys to hear this because I'd heard it very much about guys that yeah. when they drink, they have it's more common they're going to have erectile dysfunction. Yes, yes. Um, but the whiskey vagina, talk yeah. to me about that, girl. No, totally, right? Because the term is like whiskey dick that they'll say. Like you drink too much and now you cannot you cannot get an erection or you can't orgasm. It's difficult to, uh, difficult to orgasm. The same thing can happen to women. And this is where it gets problematic because a lot of times women go to their doctor, they say like, Oh, I'm having pain with sex. I'm not enjoying sex. Like there's problems. Their doctor's like, get some lube, have some, have some wine, have a few glasses of wine and you'll be fine. But actually when you're intoxicated, it can be more difficult to self lubricate, more difficult to become aroused. Like you're using a substance that is affecting your nervous system mm. and is depressing your nervous system. So everybody knows like your reaction time is down, right? This is why we don't drink and drive. Very, if you are drinking and driving, please do not do that actually. But this is why, <laughs> you know, we say those things is because your reaction time's down. You have depressed the nervous system. Well, what's the clitoris? A bundle of about 10,000 nerves. So how is that going to respond to stimuli when you've used a drug that now is basically like numbing things out? And so we can have issues with arousal tissue becoming engorged. We can have the lubrication issue, but it can be incredibly frustrating because you're like, I cannot orgasm. It's been like 40 minutes and I'm getting raw. Like what is happening? Even in a solo session, mm -hmm. it can be incredibly difficult to orgasm because because you're intoxicated. Okay, and so I assume multiple org orgasms can be even harder to have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so talk to me about actually m multiple orgasms and squirting, because mm -hmm. I just, I'm just gonna assume, um, can I lose faith for myself? But it's very interesting to go, ooh, how can I figure out how to yeah. squirt? Yeah. Like, I was the person that started with, I, I'm the, I can't orgasm, I, I, it's just not me. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm one of those unfortunate people that totally. can't, right? That's where I started from. Then I met my husband, my life changed, multiple orgasms out of, you know, yeah. whatever. And then the squirting part is like, okay, is this a type of person that can do it? Is it something that you can train, just like going to the gym? Um, and then is it benefits to squirting? Yeah, there's no known benefits to squirting, so I'll just say that. Um, oh, okay. Some people, I know, right? <laughs> um, but we haven't studied it much because even, you know, the jury's out of like, is it just urine or is it like, what is it? Mm. Um, there seems to be some, so there's some urea in the fluids, um, but it also has a sweet taste to it. So it appears to be coming from the skein's gland. So that's all to say, you're not just peeing. So people will be like, oh, you're just peeing. No. It's not just peeing, because they've actually done imaging, finding that the bladder, um, someone empties their bladder, they have sex, they squirt, but then they're like, oh, but then there was fluid in the bladder when we imaged again. So it's all very confusing. Mm. Um, and really, like, I mean, so many people like to pathologize it or just make it like, oh, that's just a porn thing, which in porn, they will pee and they will, um, they will like push and bear down to make that urine squirt. Mm. Do not recommend. You're gonna destroy your pelvic floor and end up with urinary inco incontinence at some point in your life, but definitely as you age, if you keep up that practice. So not a good idea. So in theory, everyone should be able to squirt, um, but it's not something that like anything's wrong with you if you don't squirt. Um, it sometimes takes certain positions. Sometimes there's toy stimulation happening. Um, sometimes women only experience it while they're pregnant where there's all this pressure, all of this circulation down there. Sometimes women only experience it with anal sex, so it really just depends. Wow, with anal sex, because yeah. it's pressing down? That's the thing that I'm like, huh, anatomy wise, like where you are, like why does it work, why does it work that way? Mm. Um, and it could be that there's clitoral stimulation, that um, you know, there's penetration in the anus, and then from that stimulation, the skin's glands, they shoot off, so to speak. So. 
I've always thought also about squirting about um, from women who are more promiscuous. Is that true? No. No? No. And that's something that, like, I feel like there's always some myth going around about being more promiscuous uh, with women. Um, you know, whether it's like, you're going to have a loose vagina, you'll ruin yourself from marriage, um, you're going to get more infections, like, and you can be at higher risk for STIs, and you, you definitely, I mean, you know, more partners you have. Same is true for men, though. Same is true for mm. men. Speaking of actually being loose, I know that that's one thing that a lot of women, I haven't had children, so I don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. But I've heard that that's one thing that women are paranoid about. Yeah. And so my question is, just out of curiosity, uh, is it paranoia because they don't like the feeling or because they're worried they can't please their partner? Uh, it's the latter in most cases. Um, women are told all the time that like loose vagina is like the worst thing ever. Yeah, and the vagina doesn't really work that way. I mean, it's essentially an accordion of tissue. Like it expands, um, it passes a whole human and you will have more tissue because it expanded. There's a lot of people who report better sex, both partners, better sex after vaginal delivery. Mm. Um, part of that may be because you got so comfortable with your body. Part of that may be because there is more tissue there. Another part is because things actually spread. The clitoris is more exposed now. Um, there was a lot more uh, sensation. There was a lot more hormones flowing in the body. So there can be changes that are beneficial from that. But the, I think what's really problematic is that you see, I see all the time men on the internet being like, oh, you want it tight. A tight vagina is the best. And I always laugh because I'm like, you really have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, this is another, like, tell me you don't know the female body without telling me because a tight vagina is not a ready vagina. It is the equivalent of a flaccid penis. Like, this is not somebody who is interested in anything that you have going on right now because things are being locked down. I think about, like, you know, the movie mm. Alien and Sigourney Weaver's like running through like these like portholes, right? And is like closing in. Like that is the vulva being like, oh my God, Alien. Like this is like, we do not want anyone foreign in here right now. And so that can actually be a sign then someone is not ready. Someone is afraid. And um, it sometimes can be a case of vaginismus. And so we don't want a tight vagina. When you become aroused, the vagina actually tense. So the um, tissue expands, the cervix will actually move back, and it's all making, it's like, maybe there will be penetration. We don't know, but we're ready. We're going to be ready either way. Mm -hmm. That is arousal. That is somebody who is into you. That is like you've put in the work, like things are ready to go. If things are tight, mm -mm, that's not it. And that's, I would say, you know, on the same vein of, um, talking about childbirth, um, the husband stitch. I talk about this in the book. I think it mm. is it is a very gross practice in medicine. There's still a lot of abuse of the female body, especially in obstetric violence um, when it comes to what physicians do. And the husband stitch, especially because it's often being done without consent, is where they put an extra stitch. So if you tear or if they cut you, which really has no evidence, they shouldn't be doing that. But if you tear, because that does happen, and they stitch you up, sometimes they're like, oh, I'll put an extra stitch at the top for your husband because it'll make sex better. And ultimately what it actually does is it causes pain with sex and nobody has sex. Now there's actually no sex. So tell me how you like modifying, manipulating her vagina with a man only in mind, not her body in mind, doing it for her husband has actually helped anyone. It hasn't. Now he's not having sex. She hates sex. Like it's very problematic. Mm. And aren't people getting like almost like plastic surgery yes. on this? Like, oh yeah. God. Yeah. Pl yeah. This is the thing that I find really concerning is that um, clitoral anatomy isn't really taught in medical schools and it's not like we just are figuring it all out. Mm. And yet you have surgeons out there with a knife cutting up this area so that it looks good without any real thought to how does it feel? How does it function? And that is very problematic, I think, in what medicine will do to women's bodies sometimes is it's more about the aesthetics. Is it aesthetically pleasing? Um, and rather than thinking about the function. Because mm. your vulva wasn't made to be stared at. Like, your body isn't made to be looked at. Your body has all of these amazing functions that it performs, and yet everything always comes back to, like, how does your body look? How does your body look? I mean, this is something after I had my second child, um, and I had, like, uh, you know, I was 40, so very different collagen, very different everything going on but I had a much larger postpartum belly afterwards. And I took photos and I just shared it online. And I'm like, I just, your body isn't made to be looked at. It's not. Your body, like, look what my body accomplished. And then when you think about sex as well, are you having pleasurable sex? Are you enjoying it? Then who cares what it looks like down there mm -hmm. if you're enjoying it? And that is where I think um, 
we're doing a really big, big disservice. The funny thing is, so here's where I ended up on some CD websites and stuff. Uh, so I actually like made a trip to Pornhub because when you look at wine, physicians say labiaplasty is happening. So that's actually um, taking away of the tissue of the labia, what people call the lips, mostly to get rid of the inner labia um, so that it's tucked in all nice oh, and neat. God. I know, right? I, I, I can't help but like Kegel every time I talk about it. Like my little vulva's like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> like <laughs> it's terrifying to think about. Um, and there are some women, they do get it done because they are struggling with body image or they are having discomfort because there is such hypertrophy. So I don't want to shame or dismiss anybody who's getting it done for those reasons and it has improved their life. But what's problematic is that women are being told like, oh, like your vagina doesn't look, your vulva doesn't look right. So we're talking about the outer tissue. Your vulva doesn't look right. Therefore, you need to have this surgery. Doctors are looking to porn and saying, this is because of porn. We blame porn for this. So I was like, well, I want to know. What do we have like trimmed up labia going on in porn? No, we do not. I had saw I had saw so much variety of vulvas, and I found on Pornhub they like voted like you know top vulvas. Um, they didn't use the anatomically correct terms, but we're we're doing that here. And with that, there was the like the top voted were was what people call the Audi vagina, which is where the labia minora is actually on the outside. Mm. And they voted everything was like so much variety. And then I went, went and I got my Netter's Anatomy textbook and I opened it up and I was like. It's us. We're the problem. Mm. Here is a pink uniform and hovelar vulva that is only an innie, and this is all we're showing in medicine. You go to Medscape, you go to like these websites, these physician, you know, based websites, and it is the white archetype of like uniform and color and everything neat and tucked away and, and uniform and symmetrical. And I'm like, it's us. We're the, it's not porn. Porn is like, give me all the variety, which is also to say that if you're a woman and you're concerned, like my male partner, you know, is going to look at it and think, um, it turns out they're really into it. They're really into the variety mm -hmm. down there. Um, that is what, that is what, you know, per the porn surveys that men are craving. So that is just, that to me was like such a light bulb moment of like, medicine is the one that only shows like this uniform perfect vulva like that is who mm. is showing all of that and when you look at pornography it is is real bodies like and yes there is augmentation there is labiaplasty there are breast implants like all of that happens but then there is also like all of these very real bodies where men are actually like i want to see a postpartum body like i want to see like these different changes which is what does outside of that sphere we are told something completely different right like it's like there's this like mm. there's the truth that lies underneath the aesthetic of it all what's interesting though as you were talking i was like but actually i think they do a disservice to guys because at least in the porn that i've seen it's always like they're always huge <laughs> yeah. and it's like i've heard you even talk about the, the goldilocks penis yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, really? and i was like it's funny because porn may help women if you just watch and go, look, we're ladies, like there's all types, like yeah, yeah. men like all this. But with the guys, I've never seen a guy that's like got a small penis. Yeah. It's always a gigantic I know. Horse. Now I'm like, I have to go research that. Um, <laughs> but isn't mind. it true? Yeah, I mean, it is like, uh, you think about like the movie Boogie Nights, like the yes, whole reason they wanted yes, Mark Wahlberg, um, not because he's just Mark Wahlberg and he's beautiful, um, but because like, you know, he had a long Johnson, like there was all this talk around that. Um, it's so funny though, when you talk to women, women are terrified of large penises. Um, and my friend who's a urologist, we were in a conversation and I was talking about how like, whenever people ask me if size matters, I'm like, it does because if it's too big mm. it's scary or like you have to make accommodations and like it's it's not the you know people are like oh if they have a micro penis it will be um you know horrible and and all of these things and it's like but you don't even orgasm from penile penetration like clitoris is the way so there's lots of people who are in partnerships with someone who has a quote micro penis and, and for people at home that may not know it's like what three inches yes yes so it's it's you know not what you would see on the on the porn scale right where those are like eight inches plus um as you're as we're talking about this i'm like wow like i need to do more research but lots of people have very pleasurable sex with penises that size because the way to orgasm is clitoral stimulation so it's penis is not even required some people love penis some people don't mm -hmm. like and that's really about personal preference but when I was talking to my friend, who's a urologist, he's like, 
I hear that all the time. He's like, any man who has a, a long penis that or a wide penis, that is their biggest problem is they're like, I cannot find a sexual partner because I don't want to hurt them. Like there's, there's a struggle with that. So you're right. There is what we see in porn and that can be a big disservice to men. But really that's like, it's so ironic, right? Because it's like, we've got female bodies and we've got variation. Why is it that men want to see large penises? Like, is this a power thing? Is this mm -hmm. like, like, and um, it's just so interesting to, to think about that and how that's glorified. And that might be another reason why women aren't watching the heterosexual porn is because mm -hmm. big penises can be really scary. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, I was just in conversation with two women yesterday and they were like, oh yeah, like I had to get out of relationships because his penis was too big. And I was like, I didn't know what to do with this. And it was scary and it was hurting and I was just having problems. And um, in the book, I talk about the O-nut, which is an accommodation. So you can actually slide that on. And it's just basically like little spacer rings that you have a buffer there. And then he's still getting stimulated. He's get, still getting pleasure, but you're controlling the depth of penetration. I'm like, how did somebody not invent this like decades ago? Mm -hmm. Like this is such a needed device because it's a real bummer to have compatibility with somebody um, in all the ways and then sexually it's incredibly frustrating and you can't have pleasurable sex together. And I know there's people who are like, that's so superficial and that shouldn't matter. It does matter. It is a part of the relationship that does matter that can be part of the, you know, the shame spiral that you can get into. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because that's what I was going to add is that like then, like we're already dealing with and things that we've spoken about so much today, right? Mm -hmm. Is how much shame and guilt that we have over things because we've been told a certain way, which actually isn't true. Yeah. And like, again, I'm always trying to see it from the other side. I'm like, I actually get the problem with the guys because they're, they're seeing porn where they're seeing oh my God, look at this guy. He's like, you know, 10 inches or whatever. He's making women squirt left, right and yeah, center. Yeah. That's what a quote unquote man must mm -hmm. be. And so now if I've got whatever size, I'm now either less than or I'm comparing. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about the people, the guys that have the micro penis, like that really fucking sucks for them because yeah. women have been taught, shown in porn yeah. that actually what makes a man, again, I'm doing quote unquote for anyone just listening, is the bigger the better. And yeah, yeah. I'm now thinking about how that does the men a disservice and then they feel the shame and then what they bring into the, the bedroom, right, with the mm -hmm. confidence part of it, I'm sure then just changes everything. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about just how much uh, people are shamed about their bodies in general and then you take it to the genitals and it's a whole next level, mm. right? I mean, it is, I think when it comes to genital shame, it is just as bad for men as it is for women. I think there's a lot more um, euphemisms and jokes that have been thrown around about female anatomy and men have been able to dominate spaces where they throw that around. And so that has been something I think has gotten more attention. But I mean, it is, it is completely socially acceptable to shame somebody for having a small penis when you look at what happens in media, when you look at what happens um, just in conversations online is that socially it's okay to have a laugh about that and it really shouldn't be yeah the last thing is where is our g-spot oh <laughs> highly debated does it even exist yeah. yeah so um so it used to be thought that like on the anterior wall so belly button side um about like you know about the two knuckles in maybe a little bit further there there's a g-spot this is now very highly debated because now that, now that we understand the clitoris isn't just this little button but it's like this wishbone structure that comes down the question is now is it actually the clitoris like is it actually the oh. internal clitoris that has been being stimulated and so this is something that like you will see i mean people fight about this like they get big mad about like no of course there is a g-spot no there's no way there's a g-spot like that's just misinformation and like and what people trying to help you have better sex is that like horrible the the what it comes <laughs> down to is that i'm like if you find that's pleasurable who cares what spot it is like who cares what spot it is if you find it pleasurable there's some people who like their cervix um stimulated they find that incredibly pleasurable um there's people having nipple gasms there's people thinking off like whatever it is if you if you can check the box that that was pleasurable for me it's normal and who cares what we call it or what we name it like you don't have to have like i feel like that is part of like you know what magazines and everything do is they've got a name like you know the next best orgasm like the corgasm you can get off by working out and i'm like it's a very spontaneous mm -hmm. thing nobody's intending to they're just like doing a core exercise and then they're like something just happened or the 
peegasm, which is where you uh, have to pee so bad. Um, usually this happens like in the middle of the night. You wake up and you're like, I'm having an orgasm. It, that's because like there's just so much stimulation happening there. I don't advise that. Don't try for a peegasm. Holding your bladder that long, you're gonna end up with UTI. That's bad news. Just work on what feels good for you. What's pleasurable for you and if you're in a partnership, the boxes you check is that it was consensual and we both enjoyed ourselves. And then we do not worry about what we're calling the, you know, what we're labeling things, whether it's kink, whether it's not kink, what your doctor would say about it, what your mom would say about it. Like, we just don't care. Just don't care. <laughs> it's normal. It's normal. Click here now to learn how to find and keep real, true love. They've had bad breakups. They've dated the wrong person. They've struggled with connection. Maybe they've been abused, whatever it may be. And one question I'd always ask people is,